Put a bit of beer in the fridge at home. I'll go and get some more. <laughs> okay. Put the next one on the weekend. <laughs> That's a rarity.
Okay, members, I think we're now in a position to declare the Economic and Community Development Committee meeting the 16th of August open. Um, can I start by indicating that the Economic and Community Development and the Finance and Business Services Committee, which follows this committee, uh, both those public meetings will be streamed live and recorded for publishing on the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of this meeting, so that means that your presence at and any or all contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. So with that warning, welcome. Um, we begin uh, by acknowledging, uh, by acknowledgement of country, the Economic and Community Development Committee acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We have uh, two councillors on leave, so if you just note that, councillors Corville and councillor Vershaw. I think apart from that we have a full complement. Um, can I have someone move the confirmation of the minutes of the last meeting, the 19th of July 2016, moved by councillor Moran, seconded by councillor Martin. Can I put those, all those in favour? Everyone? Yep, that's carried. Um, we have no registered public forums. Um, I have no chair's verbal report, but there, there is a presiding member's report that has been distributed to members. I'm going to have received a copy of that yesterday. It relates to event partnership opportunities. Everyone got a copy of that? So, um, members, um, I'm wondering if someone would like to move that, Councillor. Um, Milani, moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Martin. Have we got any discussion about that item? Or oh, people need the opportunity to read it if they don't already have it? I'm in your hands, Councillors. I'll just speak positively to, to it, to uh, Chair. It's, um, <clears throat> obviously, we're celebrating, it's a community celebration of something special um, for the Olympics and Paralympics. Um, the welcome home reception, uh, and I think um, it's it's a fitting place for that to be held this evening. Councillor Martin, do you wish to speak to it as a seconder? Sure, my right. Councillor Chair, I just um, I did read that the um, through the CEO. I just want that's fairly standard fare that we'd get called upon called upon by the state for those types of activity, activities. I presume. Yes, through the chair, that's correct. Sorry, anyone, else, anyone else wish to make any comments, Councillor Anton? I'm just asking a question. Is it in terms of clarifying your funding situation? Um, yeah, how is that working? What's the split? Is there any contribution to the state government? Yeah. Through the chair, I can respond to that. Yeah, the, the funding is 50 50 from state government and council. And again, as a follow up question, that's pretty standard procedure as well, is it? Uh, through you, chair, yes, that is. Council Moran? Did we do this last Olympics? Mm -hmm. Last mm -hmm. Just, I don't know about the past. 50 50. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, also more recently we did it for uh, Adelaide United after they uh, won the A-League Premiership as well. Just, just one more question, is there any way we can guarantee a Crows Premiership? Through the chair, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very good point. Councillor Martin, you reserve the right to speak. Councillor Milani, do you wish to sum up? Summed up. I guess the most important thing sure. in the headline in, in this is about community celebration. So I, really it's about ensuring that we cast the net far and wide to make sure everyone's included. Then can I put the recommendation? All those in favour of the recommendation, all those against, that's carried. Thank you.
We now move to items for adoption on the block. So I'll do a call over people if you could shout out those things that you wish to be called out. Um, item 7, Adelaide Oval number 2, Development Alternative Pathway Options. So, Councillor Wilkinson? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, item 8, Responses to Public Drinking and Associated Antisocial Behaviour in the Parklands. Councillor Martin. Item 9, members, that's been uh, deleted from the agenda because, um, as Councillor Milani says, she's only recently returned from home and while she might be good, she's not that good. Um, <laughs> item 10, free City Connector 2015-16 project annual update. Anyone wish to call that out? Just briefly. Councillor Martin. Um, Councillor, uh, sorry, item 11, Christmas in the City. <laughs> Um, item 12, the out of session papers to note. Councillor Wilkinson, <coughs> completely failed in the items for adoption on the rock, but never mind, let's carry on. Um, that brings us to item 7, the Adelaide Oval uh, number 2, development alternative pathway options. Councillor Wilkinson. <coughs> um, I note the recommendation from the uh, Adelaide Parklands Authority that a grit blasted um, finish be done, which gives the sandy coloured um, finish. But I note that the proposal it has that, that the uh, advice from APLA is that consideration be given to the grit blasted finish. And I note that the proposal has dis dished that and um, proposes standard asphalt. And so I would move that we support this on the basis that the path is done in clear binder asphalt. So, Councillor Long Bitumen, so per, the, per the Times Parade ground. Um, okay, Councillor Wilkinson, we've just got to get that exactly what yeah. you're proposing. So, it's coming up on the board behind me. Yep. Um, I put in the correct term is clear binder asphalt. Clear binder asphalt. Okay, members, yeah. that's. Uh, yeah. So this is an alternate motion you're putting with this included, yes. with this yeah. additional words yeah. included. Mm -hmm. We need a seconder for that. Seconded by Councillor Moran. Um, thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, we are agreeing to chopping down a lot of trees to enable this um, this pathway to happen. And I think at the very least, um, the intent of the Adelaide Park Lands Authority, which is to see this being a sandy coloured, natural looking path rather than a swathe of black bitumen, should be, um, should be followed through. And, and the least we can do is insist that the path is done in the in the blonde bitumen finish, as we should be doing for all of our parkland paths as a matter of course. Um, but you know, obviously, uh, the state management authority would rather chop down all of the trees and do the cheapest path they can, um, but which is the uh, standard bitumen. But um, I think we should be insisting that it's at least the uh, clear binder ash belt. Um, to maintain that uh, sandy, sandy appearance, and this is something that we should be looking at for all of our parklands and all of our bitumen footpaths from here on. Um, if you look at archival photographs of the city of Adelaide over the last hundred years, that's how all of our footpaths used to look until the black binder, black asphalt came onto, onto the scene. And now the technology is there, as the uh, Times Parade Ground is testimony, to have the appearance of the nice blonde. Uh, bitumen, but a serviceable waterproof coating, and that's what we should be uh, insisting on. So um, I'm not happy with the loss of all of these trees, but I'm trying to be pragmatic about it and, and uh, agree to the loss of all these trees. But on the other hand, uh, at least insist that we get a, uh, a path that doesn't look like another road, but it looks like a, uh, a, a pathway to the parklands. Um, Councillor Moran, you'll speak in a moment, and then Councillor Claremont. But before we do that, can I just ask for some um, response from um, from some advice from our administration in relation to the terminology? I, I just make the 
I'll just point out that in the original, the last time this came before us, we made a request that SMA give consideration to a quote, grit glass finish to the path in accordance with the original master plan for the site. Just that was actually a recommendation of the of oxygen. That, that, that terminology came from oxygen who are doing the, the work. I'm just wondering about the terminology, if you could give some clarity for us on that, and then I'll come to you, Councillor Moran. Oh, there we go. We're done. Um, and I, I'll um, seek clarification if I'm not actually technically correct here. We have uh, Mr. Hader from Oxygen here. Um, my understanding is the grip blasting is the um, standard asphalt service, service which is blasted, um, which then reveals the aggregate finish. Which is different. Hello, how are you, James? Which is different to the blonde bitumen, which is, is in fact um, a bitumen which is of that um, pale yellow ochre colour. So it's different to the grit blasting. Grit blasting, as I said, is standard bitumen, which is high pressure blasted, reveals that aggregate finish, which you'll see on a number of our uh, parklands trails at the minute. Did you want to add to that? Um, I think, Please go ahead, James. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, councillors. Um, I, th I think you summed it up correctly. The, as you know, from day one, we've been trying to get a grip blasted finish to the bitumen pass from the Adelaide Oval, and this is certainly an opportunity. I think the council wish to insist on it, be fine to do that. I think the question of using a clear binder, I think clear binding costs around four times the cost of bitumen because they have to clean the plant before they uh, run it through. And I do understand there are some issues, I think, with the uh, program now in terms of its longevity. So whether council would be actually, I mean, Dan might be able to help us here, but whether the council would be actually looking at uh, making that a standard in the parklands or not. Excuse me, with all due respect, this is going to enter the debate um, no, four true. times more expensive, blah, blah, blah. Give us some information that I think is important. Well, let me carry on the but I think what you said is coming into that. I don't know, Daniel, if you've got things. And um, the colour of the grip bar, the grip blast? The, the colour of the grip blast, my understanding again, so it's the bitumen, high pressure blasting, so it has a more um, browny ochre colour, but not as light as the blonde bitumen. That's certainly the treatment we have in the parklands trials at the moment. Okay, thank you for that information. If people to describe colour. Okay, so. if people have got some other questions they can ask it of you, if you wouldn't mind just staying. Oh, James, do you mind yes, just staying there if anyone wants to ask? Um, Councillor Moran, a seconder. Yes, um, I can't see how the grit blast, if it's not a, the colour is the, the colour is the um, thing, isn't it? Um, so if you're just blasting bitumen, it's still going to be a very dark colour, isn't it? Because bitumen is black. Unless you're going to blast it and make it pale yellow or sand colour, I'm not really interested. Also not interested in four times the cost. Um, jump in if it does turn a pale yellow. No? Um, uh, four times the cost obviously is a sticking point. I can understand if I was them that I'd say I want to go for the cheaper one. But we've made it very clear right from the beginning, as you have, Madam Chair, um, that this is a part, very lovely park and park. Um, that hasn't had a lot of bitumen on it, winding through the parklands. We have been very good um, in a way that we've approved uh, the removal of trees and, and, and I feel in a lot of ways we've been um, led astray on certain of, certain of the facts and have, have just agreed after the, after the fact. So I think really the SMA owes us a good quality parkland park here. And I think if it, it's, it's not a particularly long path, and if it costs four times, so be it. Um, that's, what, that's what we expect. I walk across the parade ground every day, and I can assure you that surface is excellent. It's not breaking up. Um, I check it every time because we, we, I would love us to use it. And if it's just the extra price, it's just of clearing the plant, then why can't we swap completely from bitumen to that? And have a, uh, the more work we give them, the less it will cost because the plant won't have to be cleared every time. Anyway. That's beside the point. But I really, I hope you don't vote on price. Um, I hope you vote for the best service. It's, it's without a doubt the best service. 
service and just talking to Sue, who was concerned that it might not be easy for bikes and the pushes and everything, it is um, not as hard as bitumen, but it is um, perfectly flat and um, and easy to wheel a pusher and ride a bike on. It's, it's as good as bitumen for the usage. And also comparing it to the playground, this is a walking bike path. It wouldn't have anywhere near the heavy traffic that the playground does with tanks and cars all the time. So I think we have to put price aside and pick the best one. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor Clark. Um, just a question. Um, We've got the road that's going through the through that area around the edge of, of oval number two, and then we've got a footpath. Well, we will have a footpath. At the moment, half of the footpath is gone because of the excavation to get the perfect oval shape for oval number two. What what are we putting on the road that goes around the edge of the oval? Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, it's black asphalt. Black asphalt. Oh. Okay. I'd be more concerned about that. Um, anyway, um, I thought it was going to be a, a lighter coloured surface, but it's not. You're saying it's black asphalt. How wide is that, James? Is this just Three minutes. Okay. Sorry, James. Yeah. Okay. And um, and so what you would prefer is that we have a black asphalt footpath as well, so that it'd all be done at the same time. Is that right? Um, no, I don't think they're related. Oh, okay. You wouldn't asphalt them all at the same time. Um, well, that's a construction question, but this I don't. See that they're uh, linked necessarily. One's a footpath, and the other is a, a different locality. Yeah. Well, I was there today, having a very close look at it all, and its current footpath there is black asphalt. So, um, if this sandblasted is going to give a better appearance, appearance, I don't really have an issue. My major concern was about placement of a footpath that was well used while I was there today. Lots of students walking to and from student colleges back to the university, etc. Um, being close to that road. And I walked the whole length of it again today. And it's just what used to be a three lane road each way is now a six lane highway. And we're thinking of taking a, a, a footpath out of those trees and putting it next to the road. That's my concern and I really don't like it. So when we asked everyone to go back and rethink the location of the park, how much of it have we managed to move away from the side of that very, very busy road? In total length. Um, um, yeah, it, it looks like a third of it is closer to the road and through that. The, um, it's been brought as much as possible away in the original alignment and through that. And then there's been juggling of uh, trees to minimise the number of trees that have been taken. The grades, so looking at the grades, um, as much of it is back on the original alignment as possible before it hits where the retaining wall is and it gets too steep to put that path in. Yeah, it's almost needed, like we needed a walking platform through there. I, I just, if I'd have known at the beginning that the expansion of Adelaide Oval 2 would have resulted in the putting the pathway along that busy road, I wouldn't have supported <coughs> it at all. So less concerned about the surfaces in this instance, more concerned about the placement of that footpath. Um, we've got a comment from administration on this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Two things. One is I inadvertently misled you. The, the other pathways I was referring to in the park are actually exposed concrete aggregate, not bitumen, so they're the exposed concrete aggregate. So that's the difference in the colour, so my apologies for that. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the difference in the colour there. 
Um, thank you, Chair. The other point I was, or the issue I was going to raise is um, that I'd be more than happy to go back to the SMA tomorrow to have further discussions around the finish, um, reminding them of the APLA um, resolution or APLA advice and request, which was then uh, supported and resolved by Council. So I know that the work is pending a decision, um, but uh, I'm very happy to go back tomorrow and further negotiate that. Um, yes, I don't have any questions. I just uh, wish to speak um, uh, and only to say that I won't be supporting this. Um, it's been a done deal pretty much from the start. The work began before we were told. It is um, work that was uh, proceeding or seemed to be proceeding towards uh, land that was not held by the uh, Stadium Management Authority but by Council. Um, a, a number of trees have already gone. The route of the path um, is such that people have been pushed away from what was one of the nicest walks in Adelaide onto Morford Road and three lanes, three lanes of traffic. I walked it today as well. Um, there is no proposal that I have seen uh, that would provide protection for pedestrians. They are walking beside vehicles. In addition, the width of the pathway has gone to something around about a metre. So any talk of cyclists going up and down is just impossible. People will have to stop and allow others to pass. And more than that, you know, the construction of the road is far more than I imagined. It's, it's now concrete curving and guttering. There's a stormwater drain. There's a, a concrete traffic island to manage traffic flow. It all looks pretty awful. Uh, and in addition tonight, if you accept this, you're voting to uh, pull out another 20 mature trees. Now, I know that others are going to be planted and I'm sure this project has merits. But frankly, uh, as somebody who uses that path, as somebody, somebody who speaks to a lot of people who used it and valued it, I just might support this. I think it's just a loss of more parklands and uh, the end of access to, uh, to that area that people enjoy. Anyone else wish to speak to this? Yeah. I have one question for administration, please, Chair. But the the, the, for, the mentioned blonde bitumen, could the administration just please share with us an example of where that is laid? Is that exactly what Councillor Moran is just referring to as in the Torrance Paragon, or are there other incidences that you can recall? Through you, Chair, my understanding is the Torrance Parade Ground. There's no other examples I'm being reliably informed from my left. Thank you. So, Councillor Wilkinson, back to you to sum up, unless anyone else wishes to speak. No, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you. Um, I take Councillor Martin's uh, point that the route of the path, I think, would better be. Um, through the parklands rather than next to the road. We don't be, seem to be presented with that option. It's unfortunate that we're not given an option of this route or one that slightly longer path that is um, <coughs> enables pedestrians to take a more pleasant walk no. through the parklands rather than next to the road. Um, so my amendment really is just on the basis of we're, we're stuck with the route because we've only been given one option. You know, I, I think it would be good if we could be presented with two options uh, in terms of the route, but we haven't been given an option on the route. So given that we've only got the one option on the route and we're being asked to um, allow for a large number of significant trees to be chopped down, the least we can ask for is something that doesn't look, already there's three lanes of bitumen going up Montefiore Hill. It won't be another lane of bitumen as being a thing, but at least a lane of, of, of blonde bitumen that doesn't look like an extension of the road. And I know Councillor Clarahan is big on this thing about not having paths looking like an extension of the road. And if all of our footpaths and bitumen throughout the parklands and next to streets are the blonde bitumen as our standard, and this is a good 
good opportunity to, to start it at, at the state management authority's expense, um, whilst we're allowing them to do what they want. Um, it's a good opportunity to actually get the better finish, which should basically pave the way, excuse the pun, for how all of our parks and parklands should look, rather than just the cheapest bitumen, and um, um, which I don't think, I, I think our parklands are better than that. And um, so uh, that's why I believe that we at least start the Blonde Asheville, which if you look at the Torrens Parade Ground, is perfectly serviceable. That was laid. 20 years ago, it's still, still standing up, even to tanks, as Councillor Martin refers to, and cars parking up, let alone just pedestrian traffic. So there's no question about the durability of the Blonde Bitumen. Um, it's uh, very serviceable, and uh, it has the appearance of our historic uh, Blonde gravel paths, but it's more serviceable because it is a sealed finish as opposed to a, a, a gravel finish, which is slippery and, and, and uh, and has issues with an unsealed surface. So uh, I urge members to uh, support this um, this motion and hopefully this will set the direction of how all of our parkland paths from here on. So members, I've put that. All those in favour? All those against? Sorry, all those in favour? Let's do oh, that again. the motion or amendment? It's, a, it's the motion. Oh, it's the motion. Yep. All those against? <coughs> That's carried. And um, uh, I think we'd all appreciate it if you did communicate that to the SMA as soon as possible. And, and if there are any practical implications, then we can discuss that at the council meeting. Um, so that brings us to item um, eight, which is responses to the public drinking and associated antisocial um, behaviour in the parklands. I'm just going to start that by um, calling on um, uh, our uh, administration through Sean McNamara to just talk us through this a little, just give us a bit of background and then we can start to advance on the moment. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, members, this will be the fourth time that you've considered either the introduction or the extension of a uh, timed parkland, uh, parklands dry area. Uh, after a three month introduction, then a six month extension, then a 12 month extension. Uh, without entering the debate, I'll just try and give a little bit of history to provide some context to the report. Uh, so at the last uh, extension, which uh, was requested in September 2014, Council made it clear uh, that they didn't wish for the dry zone to be a permanent uh, position and that it should be treated as a transitional arrangement. Uh, and it sought to work with government and other key stakeholders to develop uh, supporting strategies to assist vulnerable people in the parklands. and. Uh, and ultimately move to a position where a, a dry area may not be necessary. Um, the seven strategies have been developed uh, and have been progressed to some extent over the course of the 12 months, and that is uh, that is detailed in the, uh, the report. So without going into that at length, certainly two of the positive aspects, more positive aspects have been the diversion to treatment trial, uh, which has uh, proven to be a particularly effective mechanism for the, the services that participate in that trial and also the vulnerable persons framework. The evaluation report also outlines uh, all our, uh, our data points and findings since the inception of the parkland timed dry area. Uh, displacement is certainly noticed, uh, sorry, noted as a genuine issue. Uh, it's also worth noting the trends in terms of um, emergency department presentations, mobile uh, uh, assistance patrol pickups, sobering up units, uh, admissions, um, although it's not possible for us to draw a conclusion as to whether the uh, introduction of a dry area has impacted those numbers or not. Um, I'd note that a number of services are working to support and deliver the supporting strategies that sit alongside the dry area. Um, and they have, uh, um, they have stated that the reduced focus on antisocial behaviour in the, the parklands through the dry area from residents and businesses and possibly media have made it easier for them to engage with vulnerable people in the parklands setting. Uh, the senior officer group that has uh, continued to meet uh, regularly through the um, uh, through the time that the dry area has been in place uh, believes that um, certainly continuing to pursue the supporting strategies is an appropriate thing to do uh, and that the dry area is an appropriate 
um, mechanism to have in place while those strategies are, uh, are further pursued. So a senior officer group have, uh, have endorsed administration's recommendation uh, that, um, uh, that we seek a further 12 month extension on the, uh, on the dry area. Uh, but also the senior officers group have agreed that it is critical um, that we define uh, to what extent those strategies need to progress so that we can paint a clear picture for you in the future as to when you might be able to say these strategies are effective enough uh, and that we can consider um, removing the dry area. And Councillor Martin, you pulled this item out, I think. Um, do you wish to move it or do you want someone else to move it? <coughs> No, I want to amend it, uh, okay, if I may, if I have a seconder. Well, I want to move it. Uh, well, Councillor Martin pulled it out. Well, he wants to amend it. He gets first crank okay. at putting an alternate motion or yeah. an alternate motion on yeah. the amendment. Yeah, and the alternate motion is that uh, four is deleted. So you need a seconder for that alternate motion? I'll second it to you, Councillor Martin. Second by Councillor Curran. Thank you, Councillor Clarendon. Um, look, I, I have proposed this amendment uh, because I draw your attention to the report provided by the administration to page 31 of attachment A. And at the very bottom of the page, it says that the people of South Terrace have had no recorded instances of large congregations in Veal Gardens almost of 2016. Problem solved for people of South Ward. But at the same time, on page 18 of the administration's report, at 17, it notes that large groups of people are now congregating around the riverbank, Torrens Parade Ground and up to North Terrace. In fact, in several places, the document showed that there's an increase in alcohol-related antisocial behaviour in the CBD in places like Hindley Street. And this one for me, and I know that the administration's not keen to uh, uh, connect the dots, but if you go to page 35, you will find a graph. And it shows that the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who represent the majority of people who are affected by this dry zone, you will see that the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people presenting to the Royal Adelaide with alcohol-related injuries or alcohol problems, including psychosis, is at a three-year high. Now, the problem has got worse, not better. And if anyone thinks it's fixed, they're absolutely dreaming. The dry zone has moved the problem and the administration referred to it. It's called displacement. And the experts are telling us, and it's uh, clear at page 21, that just moving vulnerable people out of a particular area actually increases the risk of harm to them and the people around them because they're no longer visible. They're not able to access the services that provide the assistance that they need. Now, that is the true impact of displacement. And, and it is not displacement and this whole dry zone thing a solution at all. Now, I know that the Lord Mayor understands this. He spent some time with the health and social welfare representatives recently, and I hope that he'll support this. But the extension of the dry zone is going to be putting more people at risk for yet another year. And it's not only that, it is discriminatory. It looks it, and it is, because it singles out Aboriginal and vulnerable people. It says to them, you are not welcome in this area if you bring alcohol. Now, I'd say to you that I am indebted uh, to the, uh, the senior officers group, I, I am, uh, supportive of the measures, the vulnerable persons framework, uh, the fine diversion to treatment strategy is excellent, the engagement strategy, the harm minimization and the proposals for sit down areas. But the dry zone area does not work. It simply makes the problem worse and discriminates against people who would otherwise receive help. Councillor Martin, you 
Now, I would ask all of you to consider just knocking out this amendment. Uh, knocking out at least the uh, the clause, that's clause four, and adopting the other measures. Uh, in this way, I think you can demonstrate to people that we are concerned about the problem, but we're not going to exacerbate it further. Councillor Clarendon, seconded. I'll reserve my right. Councillor Moran, then the Lord Mayor. Well, I, I <clears throat> completely oppose everything that uh, Councillor Martin said, and I foreshadow that I'll move the original motion when this, I hope, fails. Um, it is easy to take the high moral ground and say that you're concerned about the um, people that are being displaced. This displaced, um, as um, Madam Chair said in the radio today, to hospitals, to care centres, to their homes uh, and so forth. Nobody says that the dry zone is more than a blunt instrument. We suggested that the dry zone come into the South Park lands because the people who resided and worked in um, opposite Mill Gardens and South Park lands were living in what literally was a war zone. Um, so therefore that brought it to a head and we asked the government to make a dry zone down there. The government then decided to make a dry zone in all the park lands, which I, I think it was quite a good idea, really. Um, but we, we were concerned for the residents and the businesses. But but having been down multiple times, um, we were also concerned for the, um, the drinkers in the parklands. These are what's uh, considered medically as annihilation drinkers. This was not a social setting, a quiet um, group of people having a quiet drink in the parklands. These were people <laughs> drinking till they became psychotic. Um, as seen by many a video that all the councillors would have seen. This is a situation that could not go on for one more minute. Um, and we brought the dry zone in. Um, if anybody had seen what happened, there would be no, uh, no problem. Uh, talking to the uh, sit-down areas, another uh, uh, view I vehemently oppose. For many a year, Via Gardens was a sit-down area. I saw little aid agencies or little improvement with the care of people down there. In fact, some aid agencies were dropping women down there that they picked up drunk in another area of the city. So it was recognised as a gathering place. It was dangerous, dangerous for the people that lived down there, but most of all dangerous for the, the, the vulnerable drinkers down in the park lands. The council isn't um, the level of government that um, can deal with mental illness, um, indigenous separation from main society, alcoholism. We put a dry zone there and we in our small way, in our much as we can support the government. They have streets to home. They have the services. We have seen help, but obviously not enough help. So if the dry zone has failed, the dry zone has failed in what it was meant to do. If the problem of drinking and annihilation drinking has, is still there, that is squarely at the feet of the state government. They need, we had Monsignor Capo who told us all that the situation was practically solved some years ago. There were only seven rough sleepers. Mm -hmm. We knew just by driving your car in Adelaide that there were a lot more than that. So we've been failed year after year after year by the state government's um, input into this. If there are more people drinking, if there are more this, that is in their area to do. We are a council and we look after the parklands so they can be used safely by all people. And that's why we asked for the dry zone. And it annoys me when we have to argue this time and time again. I completely disagree on the will of the last council, we did it last time, was to make it permanent. We are sick of tearing ourselves to bits, saying this is a win. Until global mental illness is cured and alcoholism is cured, there will always be a need in our parklands for a dry zone. Once they're cured, then, then we won't need it. But don't point the finger at people saying that, that people that vote for dry zones don't care about Indigenous and um, people outside of society who have a huge problem. The answer is not to create a Christmas island in the park lands. That's what Anglicare would like to do. They bought a house there. They wanted to, to look after them in the park lands. No, the homeless and the drinkers deserve better than that. They don't deserve to be flung a few tents and um, a few sleeping bags. They deserve to be taken into care and looked after. The parklands are not Soweto, they are not Christmas Island. And I take great umbrage when people take a higher moral ground 
painting the people that want the dry zone as somehow uncaring snobs. That is not the case. We are the caring people. The people that want to leave the drinkers out, drinking themselves to death in the parklands, they are the uncaring people. And um, councillors, just on, I've got the Lord Mayor and Councillor Wilkinson to speak, but just before I do that, I've just been, it's been pointed out to me by administration that in, uh, for it to make sense deleting paragraph four, um, Councillor Martin, you probably also need to delete paragraph three, which relates to working out when the dry zone, a meaningful process for when the dry zone can be. No, not at all. I think that's entirely compatible. What, what I'm saying, uh, you'd obviously have to have a discussion about how you would phase it out. That's quite reasonable. I'm saying that I'm opposing the extension of the dry zone for another year. Okay, okay. So be it. Um, all right, Councillor. Um, sorry, the Lord Mayor. I'm going to reserve my, my right to debate, Chair, but I'm just going to ask a question through the administration, if I may. Uh, in your opening preamble, Sean, you intimated at least that um, uh, more time may be required for further assessment. Could you just please, for the benefit of the room, extrapolate on that? It's, it's possibly more that there's more time needed for the strategies to embed. So as an example, um, uh, the diversion to treatment uh, trial, which has been operating since uh, uh, late last year and is due for re review uh, in October, was restricted to a certain number of services who could participate uh, through the um, operations group that sits under the senior officers group. We know there are more services who would like to participate in that trial. Um, the trial is not at capacity uh, at this point in time. It's operating at about 50% of its um, uh, type of limit capacity. So uh, the chance to continue to um, to develop that trial and see if it can operate at capacity. At this point in time, there are about um, $24,000 worth of fines uh, that have been um, worked off through uh, through treatment over a period of time. And the um, uh, Drug and Alcohol Services SA believe that there's potential to um, work off as much as $300,000 worth of fines uh, in total. So that's the sort of capacity the trial's got, but it hasn't had a chance to uh, to reach that capacity yet. Also, the vulnerable persons framework is proving effective, but it's fairly embryonic. Um, agencies are learning how to work with each other and how best to share information with each other. They will get better at that uh, with more time. Uh, and the suggestion we've had from some of these agencies is that um, the reduced focus from the public on people congregating in the parkland is allowing them to engage with people in a more meaningful way. There's no way of knowing with certainty that if the um, if the dry zone was removed that they couldn't still do that. Um, but there is a fear that it might impact vulnerable people's willingness to engage with them in a parkland setting. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Chair, I will um, speak very briefly. I, I, I find this an absolutely vexing issue, as I know each of my fellow members do too, but um, in absence of any uh, definitive proof, and this is why I'm asking the questions of administration, that whether we do or we don't have a uh, dry zone, what material impact is that going to have for the, the root problem? Uh, and uh, we, we are to some degree as a local council, and I do agree with Councillor Moran at the wrong end of the stick on this, um, is that the, our community looks to us to solve this problem through our decision with regards to whether we do or whether we don't uh, support a dry zone. And it's not the root source of the problem, although sometimes the finger gets pointed at us as it is. I don't want to point the finger at the state exclusively either, because it is an incredibly complex problem of which I think to some degree we all play a part. Uh, I don't think we can quarantine it just into exclusively the hands of one body, but um, it is a vexing issue. I do understand Councillor Martin's discussion, but I must say that uh, what Councillor Moran is saying has a lot of merit, uh, a lot of merit, because if we maintain our dry zone, uh, there could be an argument that uh, yes, uh, displacement uh, may happen, but if displacement raises visibility to other areas of the city, you could argue that people are safer. I don't know, but I don't have that evidence in front of me. So this is why I'm very reliant on our administration in terms of their recommendation. So based upon my reliance on administration's recommendation, I'll probably stick with it and I'll probably stick with Councillor Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, 
I've had discussions with um, various people down in the South Parklands, including our staff who are there all day, every day, dealing dealing with the issues. I think they've got a very good basis to, to evaluate the situation and I put a fair bit of credibility in, in the advice I've got from, from those people without naming anyone in particular, but they're all of the same view. And, and the sort of advice that I've been providing it is that the word has got round that, had got round that basically uh, whilst in the APY lands and other areas in Central Australia, um, Indigenous populations had put dry zones in their own areas there, the Adelaide Park lands was a, was a free drinking zone and so people were actually moving to Adelaide because it didn't have a dry zone thing that was actually imposed in the APY and other, other, other lands in other parts of Australia. So it was actually the fact that we didn't have a dry zone was actually causing people to come to the Adelaide Parklands, which is actually compounding the problem. Now, I, I, I take Councillor Martin's point that the problem has shifted from the South Parklands to the banks of the Torrens, and I can understand that residents and businesses in South Terrace ring up the police and complain because their life's intolerable, but there's no one living on the banks of the Torrens Parade Ground, and so the police probably aren't enforcing, this is my, my guess, they're not enforcing the dry zone there. But if, if they were enforcing the dry zone right across the parklands per the state government you know, position, then there wouldn't be any incentive to come down from the APY lands and other than to, to drink in the parklands because anywhere in the parklands, be it South Terrace or, or, or next to the Torrens, um, you wouldn't be able to drink there. And then, and then, because that's actually compounding the problem. So I, I see the problem is that it's not being properly enforced and therefore it's shifted the thing because basically no one's complaining. The University of Adelaide is not complaining about people drinking at the banks of Torrens and things like that. So I, I, I support extending the dry zone because it, it does work. And the 11 to eight you know, hours enables, um, you know, users of the parklands to, to consume alcohol during the day for picnics and the like. But after 8 p.m., you know, when people have had a dinner or a barbecue or something like that, and or before 11 a.m., you know, we, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be allowing alcohol consumption in the parklands. And I think it's reprehensible that, uh, you know, some of our biggest retailers are selling um, cask of five litre wine 200 metres from schools in South Terrace at 9 a.m. in the morning cashing in on, on those people's misery. Um, so, you know, that was part of my original motion to uh, change the hours so that you don't get the big retailers basically just cashing in on the city by selling people cars of vine at, at, at 9.01 in the morning, which is what was happening. Um, so um, uh, I implore members to, um, uh, to, to uh, not support the amendment and, and go with the original motion and, and for us to implore upon us staff to communicate with police SA to uh, enforce the dry zone properly so that there is no incentive for people just to come to the other parklands just to compound the problem which is what's happening. Councillor Ray. Thank you Chair. Um, look as a uh, South, the only South Ward councillor here I think this is particularly pertinent uh, from, from my point of view. I've spoken to a lot of residents about this issue and I have to say not, not one has ever um, taken an unnecessarily difficult view about the whole situation. I think everybody uh, in that neck of the woods is very sympathetic to the problem, but what, what's a local council to do? I mean, I, I support what Councillor Moran has already said. I mean, this is a, 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 and the Lord Mayor as well, it's a vexing issue, and it's one which I think is totally out, outside the remit of local government. But we've seen uh, Sean McNamara and his team do an absolutely outstanding job in trying to find other solutions while still maintaining the status quo. And I'm afraid, I think the only status quo is to continue the support for the dry zone. There, there is no other circuit breaker that's going to help here. And it's not just a matter of the residents, it's also a question of the safety of the, of the vulnerable people themselves. I've never understood how, how that, and I'm sure I'll be emailed to tell me exactly why that's the case tomorrow, but I've never understood why it is that the pour out is such a bad thing. I mean, uh, there's got to be a circuit breaker. We are not invested with all the tools to deal with this very complicated situation. So we have to do what we can do to support our residents. And this, whether people like it or not, is, is the best we can do. And I think Sean and his team have done a magnificent job liaising with the various government agencies, have come a long way. Hopefully we continue to do that and continue to find other, other ways we can help. 
that I think this council has gone above and beyond the, the call of duty in this in this situation, and it's a credit to to the administration and their staff. So look, I think in the meantime we've got to hold the fort, um, and uh, I encourage everyone to uh, to reject the uh, amendment and support the rise up. Members, before I go to the next speaker, um, we need to adjourn this meeting. So I wonder if I could ask for someone to move for an adjournment moved by Councillor Clarahan, seconded by seconded by seconded by the Lord Mayor. Can I put that? All those in favour of an adjournment, that's carried. Um, members can I hand over to the chair of the next meeting? I declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting open on Tuesday the 16th of August 2016 at 16.25pm and I seek someone to adjourn the meeting. Uh, moved by Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Antic. Any debate? If none, I put that. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Meetings adjourned. And as I reopen uh, the meeting of the Economic Community Development Committee, um, and I think uh, Councillor Abiat. Look, just don't want to add too much to this um, uh, debate. I understand Councillor Martin's sentiments. Uh, it is a concern. We are not solving the problems that we're currently having in relation to the antisocial behaviour and also the victims as a result of this in the parklands. That is definitely not the case. The problem is not being solved. Yes, to some degree, it is being displaced. But the one thing we are not talking about is the problem is solved for residents. I mean, that is the only difference between having a, uh, a dry zone and not having a dry zone. Uh, basically, if we can acknowledge that the problem is not solved, that it does require council attention, police attention, also the support of the state government and bodies within the state government that help resolve that issue in the long term. The one thing we need to acknowledge is today, and also when we considered this not very long ago, we have not had one of our residents sitting here complaining. I remember clearly at the previous council, we held a meeting of residents uh, at South Terrace where a lot of the residents attended and we have had many cases, and I'm talking over the 10, 15, 20 people that were concerned about their safety, concerned about the perception of safety in the area, and there was big concerns. That problem is solved for our residents. I will acknowledge and I'm very sympathetic that other problems when it comes to the victims of, um, uh, of uh, I guess, uh, you know, people being uh, drinking in the parklands and having to deal with these issues and those social issues, I don't think all the problems are solved, but to, to, to simply flick the switch and turn it back on and then create another nightmare for residents in the city, that also doesn't solve the problem. So look, I, uh, I, I do um, understand what Councillor Martin's trying to achieve. If he was in the state government, I think that is literally the position he should take. And that's where you should push and provide the support and, and have that approach. But at council, we are very limited on what we can do and can't do. And my focus and my attention at the moment, although I'm very sympathetic to this, is also to make sure that our ratepayers feel safe in our homes and also visitors of our city in the parklands. Um, so the you your yeah. Um, look, I'm, I thank everyone for their contribution, and it is a very difficult issue. Um, in a former life, um, I was responsible for putting <coughs> together applications um, to government for the installation of dry areas uh, in those days. And uh, and that was to deal with alcohol-related um, antisocial behaviour uh, in re near residential areas. And I totally supported uh, the installation of dry areas in that incident, in that, in that case. And here we are dealing with an even more vulnerable group of people uh, and they need somewhere to go. Um, where the safest place is for that is open to debate. Um, obviously, we had to deal with the issue in South Terrace. It was a very unpleasant situation emerging there. Uh, and I would find that very distressing personally to have to live with um, the behaviour where people just drink themselves into a state of absolute oblivion where they don't know what they're doing. And indeed, um, we saw instances of people assaulting each other, which was really distressing. Um, yes. The, the um, dry areas has resulted in displacement, there's no doubt about that. But perhaps one of the things that's going to sway me on this occasion is the extent of the work that's been undertaken by the senior officers group. 
and indeed even the diversionary um, treatment strategy I think is a fairly creative solution uh, where there's a win-win for um, all parties and that is where people who do have um, alcohol or drug issues have new access now to treatment where they can actually also get rid of those horrible fines that they drag around with them as a result of um, their addiction to alcohol and or drugs. Um, so there's no single solution, but what in this instance I think I'm prepared to accept is the incredible amount of work, positive work and also creative strategies that are being undertaken by the senior officers group, which is a collaborative group of lots of different agencies working together as well as local government and state government. I mean, we have been given some, some data that says the, uh, there's been increase in uh, a number of incidents in Hindley Street that may or may not have any something to do with our um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, we've also had um, data that says that there's an increase in the number of admissions to hospitals that may or may not be a result of more people being here. I mean, you know, there's people have to access health and other services here in the city. Uh, if there's a family illness or an individual illness, well then people need to come, often need to come to Adelaide. Uh, it may be they come for a funeral or something else. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's an increase in the number of people who would have been involved previously. It may just mean an increase in the number of people actually present in the city. Um, but despite uh, the, those issues, I think in this situation, uh, I am actually going to um, support the original motion and, I, and of course I, I will be very interested in monitoring uh, the continuing impact of the seniors officers group and the strategies that they're implementing and as soon as that starts to fall apart and, uh, and ceases to have any impact well then I would have to question whether I support the dry zone at all but in this instance I will support it and vote against the, um, the current motion before us. Do I have any members who wish to speak, any other members who wish to speak to the current motion? Councillor Malani. I'm just going to be very brief and say I pretty much endorse the position of my fellow councillors. I won't be supporting this. I'll support the, um, the motion as printed uh, predominantly because of the um, the need to let these strategies embed further. So I won't rehash what's been said. It's all actually been very eloquently said and uh, just wanted to formally put my position forward. Councillor Martin, do you wish to sum up? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it needs to be said that this is not about the state government. Uh, this dry zone is imposed by this council. This is this council's decision to impose it. We request the state government. You you request the state government to assist in it, but it is this it is this council's decision. If this council decides not to have a dry zone, there is no no dry zone. Okay, so it is our decision, and everybody needs to understand that they're taking personal responsibility for that. This is not about the residents and businesses of the uh, the South Ward. Their lives are not the ones that are at risk as a consequence of these policies that are displacing that is, people. That is, no, no, that's, that's yeah, absolutely is correct. Risk. Our white players are at risk. That is absolutely that is correct. The, the, problem, the, problem is, the problem is that we are, by this policy, pushing people out of the areas where they can be detected and can be diverted to programs to assist them. And those statistics, I mean, they're fairly conclusive for me. 169, uh, 168 alcohol-related uh, injuries and 91 related to acute intoxication, harmful use, dependent syndrome, withdrawal state, and so on. So those people are presenting to the Royal Adelaide now in numbers that they weren't before because they have been displaced. Now, there are no figures here for other hospitals, but I'll bet, I'll bet, and uh, it's speculation, I know, but I'll bet that you'll find the same result in other public hospitals. That is, people are being pushed further up to the margins in this fashion. Now, I want to also make clear 
that displacement is not a not a matter of uh, uh, it, you can't deal with displacement by enforcement. Enforcement is part of the problem. That is to say that people are accumulating enormous personal debts. And although we have a strategy that diverts people into programs where they can uh, uh, avoid these uh, fines, they are still being applied at an enormous rate. And the administration acknowledges that it may be possible eventually to address about $300,000 in value. The value of the fines is significantly more than that. So what I'm asking people to do is to support all of the measures, the positive measures that the administration has proposed. They are all good measures, but I suspect that if you took away the dry zone uh, uh, ban, then you would find that there would be more chance of people accessing those programs. And moreover, we wouldn't leave ourselves open to those claims of discrimination. That is the nub of the argument. Now, I understand nobody's going to support it, but I ask you just to consider that and to consider also that far from this being a permanent arrangement, it needs to be transitional. 12 months is too long in my view. A few months, six months would have been a much better arrangement. At least we would have had the chance to have another discussion about this important issue in a very short space of time. But uh, if uh, people don't wish to support it, I can do nothing about that. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Can I put that motion then? All those in favour? All those against? So that's not carried. Um, and I think you foreshadowed the original motion, Councillor Moran. As you should foreshadow it as printed in your second, Councillor Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, wish to speak to it? I think everything that's said has been said, but just to answer a few things that Phil has said. Has said um, uh, displacement, yes, displaced into a hospital or to aid aid agency and alcohol um, placement, good. Um, we can do all the things. We, we had existed in South Ward a situation without a dry zone for a long time. We know what the situation is without the dry zone. And I cannot possibly see how it can be improved by letting the drinkers back in. Um, I, t I thought uh, Sam's point was very good. Um, one part has been completely solved. The problem with the, um, the interface with the residents and businesses. And trust me, councillor, it was, was life-threatening. Um, first, for the drinkers themselves, um, we got videos from um, Mr Jacklard quite often with um, the drinkers uh, lying down in the middle of South Terrace. Um, Many a doctor's surgery was um, entered during the daytime and the patients were there and threatened. Um, the behaviour was beyond appalling and that has been solved and I think the council um, has done a good job there. Our staff should not have to be dealing with the things they had to deal with down there and I'm, I'm sure um, I'd like to thank um, you for your help there too. Um, daily our, our um, rangers were going down there to pick up um, clean the site, it was just disgraceful. Um, but first and foremost, I mean, that's that's our job as a council, to keep our area safe and well run. If the drinkers are displaced to, as Councillor Wilson said, to the um, riverbank and to other areas like that, the reason it's not police is probably because they're not causing as much the interface as the site is. But you're right, we should, um, if we've got a rule, and the state government was the government that wanted us to, because the council isn't quite right. While we request the, um, the government, the government prior to that requested us, um, as you would remember, the um, minister of that, requested us, but the trigger is we have to request it, and then they'll give it. We actually only requested a, we requested 24 hours down at South, South Parklands where we, were um, particularly concerned and saying if the drinkers did move to another section, that's West Terrace um, or around the Riverbank, it wouldn't be so bad because their behaviour would impact on the residents so much and they're away from, in the West Terrace, the busy roads because they sat further in the parklands. But the government then, so this dry zone that we've had now is actually a, a, the government's dry zone as well as ours. It's not completely ours because they said the eight to what is it, eleven to eight and uh, all the park lands. So it's not just our business. But I cannot see one thing 
that would be helped by removing the dry zone. It's worked, worked quite well. The aid agencies, as to say that they're being put out of sight out of mind, I could take the aid agencies tonight after the council meeting and show them exactly where the drinkers are displaced to, back at West Terrace, down by Jolly's Boathouse, da da da. So they can go and help them there. There's, not, there's no problem with that. Um, but the dry zone has been a, a, we first started off with Victoria Square and of course it caused unsettlement because the uh, the majority of drinkers, percentage-wise, are Indigenous people, and that always makes it much more culturally sensitive and difficult to discuss. Um, but at the same time, um, I firmly believe it's the right thing to do, and I have absolutely no understanding of, of people um, that say that the best place for these people is to drink themselves dead in the park lands go into treatment. The fines, we were told, wouldn't happen, that the police would just tip out the booze. But now I've heard that the fines lead to treatment. I'm, I'm all for the fines now. But I think our dry zone has been a success. I think more people hanging them in itself or being taken to the hospital for treatment, more people having to pay their fines off by having treatment is the answer. If you didn't do that, eventually every drinker down that we saw would be dead in a couple of years. It was shocking, shocking. Um, <coughs> self-destructive behaviour towards themselves. Secondary was a destructive behaviour to our to the other parkland users and the residents. So on both sides I think the dry zone argument has the high moral ground. Just a very, very brief brief I think it's all been said, but we know this is a blunt instrument and we we know that this is not a silver bullet, but once again I think this council has gone above and beyond the call of duty in terms of trying to find other ways over and above the remit the room of its own um, standing. So look, once again, um, well done to Sean and his team. It's been a, been a good result. And um, I think it's absolutely um, uh, something we, 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 we just have to support. So I just encourage everybody to do so. Any other members wish to speak to this or can I put it? All those in favour of the motion as printed? All those against? That's carried. Thank you, members. That brings us to item 10, um, the Free City Connector 2015-16 project annual update called out by Councillor Martin with a question, I think, Councillor Martin. Do you want to put it as printed? Or, do you want to move it or do you want someone else to move it? That's the, uh, the Free City Connector. Yeah. Yes, I'll put it as printed. Item 9 was the uh, delegation oh, okay. here, so that's your item. Yeah. So item yeah. 10 is... Um, moved by Councillor Martin. Somebody want a second? Move seconded by Councillor Cohen. Mm -hmm. Councillor Martin had a question. Uh, no, look, I, I just wanted to. Oh, you had a comment. Yeah, yeah, just a short comment. I wanted to uh, acknowledge the foresight of the previous council, which I don't do often, um, <laughs> for its uh, its work in uh, expanding both the scope and the frequency of the uh, the service. Um, it has been an outstanding success. Um, page seven of the accompanying report notes um, that the old service that ran through uh, North Adelaide and South Ward in March 2013 attracted about 2,000 passengers a week. And now with the expansion of the service that's increased 450% to around eight and a half thousand people a week. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Um, it has to be one of the all time successes of the Adelaide City Council. And as I've said many times before, woe betide the person who ever tries to take away. It's been an outstanding success and I congratulate everyone who's been associated with it. Free buses, free trams, free bikes, free museums. What sort of city we're running here? Fantastic. A good one. Um, Councillor Clare and then Councillor Wilkinson. Oh, um, look, I'll just support what Councillor uh, Martin had to say. Just one other comment was, People are still very attached to Tindo. And when it sort of, you know, appears on the road, it's well, very intermittently. And that was something I wanted to ask. I thought today. Adelaide, Adelaide was at the forefront. We received world acclaim for getting that electric bus on the road. And I don't think we should be underestimating the value and the symbolism of that bus in terms of addressing alternative energies and peak oil. And I just wondered, have we got any feedback exactly of how often it is used? This one for you, Justin. For... 
Would you like to come and give us a feeling on what's happening with Tindo? I know it's back. Is it he or is she? Or is it? It's back on the road. <laughs> I'm not what it's called a gunzor, and I can't remember the timetable through the chair off the top of my head, uh, but it's in regular service to answer your question. It's now in full regular service uh, on. And, and again, I'm not sure how many runs a day it does, but it's in, actually back in force. Can I ask a third question? Certainly, Captain What have we done to, to, to get it back into full service? Uh, no. <laughs> have there been any? I'll turn this off. Just <laughs> question green. That's a good sign. Um, it actually underwent a significant upgrade in last year's budget as a result of some issues with the batteries, and that led to a domino effect with some DDA compliance issues. And that's all been fixed. It's now all a okay. So it's had uh, it's had it's been holstered. It's got new destination signage. It's got new batteries. We've got new charges. So it's now got a new lease of life, and so we're extending what is already a nine-year-old asset. Can I, can I ask a further follow-up question through the chair? Um, is, has there been sort of advances in battery technology that has enabled us to get it on the road more, or to increase its mile, its, its you know, billet distance run, etc.? I can't say mileage. What do you say? It's increase its. With all due respect, whatever. It's not related to the meetings. It's not related to the meetings. Look, I'll keep it brief. Um, this is a. It's, it is actually older technology, uh, and we do. We were doing lots of research. And we we're working with the state government on new and emerging bus technology, okay. which will actually replace no, the Tinder technology. It will have longer range, it will be more uh, serviceable, we'll get more of them. So, so we're, we're still in, looking at better, better buses. And more of them, hopefully, with Fantastic. the state government. Pleased to hear Thank it. You. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, then Councillor Mullaney. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, I'd just like to yeah, put an amendment that consideration be given. So is this in addition to? Yes, so we're accepting the report as put to us now, but consideration be given to a nominal charge for the use of the bus in the future. Oh, oh man. <laughs> you serious? Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. The whole purpose was it's free connect the bus. Okay. So, uh, um, it's called the free signal is becoming the nominal charge bus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nominal charge. yeah. <laughs> Is that not quite free? Oh, hmm? Is that the extent of your amendment? No. Your amendment? So the money goes to the area. Oh, <laughs> 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 what? Is that your election material? One moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dark crowds rolling. <laughs> Um, in speaking to that, no, no, no second. I'm asking a question. Have we captured your amendment? Is that correct? Is that what you wanted up there? <laughs> um, when, when, when this is reported back to council um, next time. In the next review. In the next review. Mm. If I could have a second to just so I can explain my rationale. Okay. In the next review. I'm not seconding. Okay, so do we have a seconder for this amendment? Not even for the second. I'd love to second it, but I can't. I'm not. So well, I'll I'll just speak in which case. The um, no, you can't, no, can speak to the, so can speak I can the speak motion. to the general motion. motion. Oh, the general I, I feel that the uh, free city connected bus is basically being abused by commuters driving in and parking in North Adelaide and then catching the free bus into town rather than paying for parking. Short. That's why I've moved that amendment. And I appreciate no one wants to, I'm happy to take the political collateral <laughs> damage. For, for doing it, but that's that's my view, and that's the view of many people. That basically it is being abused. It's it's basically people who would be quite happy to pay two dollars or something to catch it. It wouldn't then be a hundred and thirty thousand dollar annual drain on ratepayers. It would actually be something that actually make a little bit of money. Who's not going to catch the bus for two dollars? You know, you have to be pretty bloody mean. Sorry, excuse me, I retract that. You have to be pretty mean not to be prepared to pay just two dollars. 
yeah, there's a nominal charge, but I'm, I appreciate Council Albia does want to support that. Um, but you know, I think um, uh, you know, just a nominal charge like that would just make people, um, you know, maybe consider maybe riding the bike or um, using other modes of transport. But uh, at the moment, people are driving their cars, parking outside people's houses in Hill Street and and uh, and, and and west of North Adelaide is subject to a lot of it. And even parts of South Adelaide, where people just park where we don't have parking controls, and then and then catching the uh, the bus in. So it's it's most pertinent in in, in North Adelaide, where basically the western half of North Adelaide is just basically being used as a free parking lot for people driving in from wherever, um, rather than catching the bus from wherever. To, to the city proper, rather than catching proper public transport or riding a bike. So um, that's the reason for my view on that. So um, um, Thanks, Councillor mm. Robinson. I think that you made the point and the administration will have captured that point and be taking that into account when they do their review and, um, and seeing if they can make some assessment about that as part of their consideration. Um, Councillor Malani. Well, just quickly, picking up on Sue's point, um, just so you know, there's actually a group coming from India right. who found out about our bus um, on the 29th of August to have a look at it. At Tindo. Tindo, yeah. How wonderful. It's a bus. Um, it's working. Uh, unless anybody else wants to speak to it, Councillor Martin, do you want to sum up? Summed up, thank Summed up. Can I put that? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. That brings us to item 12, um, the out of session information papers to note has been called out by Councillor Wilkinson. Oh, oh, beg your pardon, item 11, called out by uh, Christmas in the City. I've looked at Councillor Milani. I know this is just about a workshop um, and I'll move it. I want to make sure two things are included in the workshop so they can be taken on notice. Well, I'm happy to move it if my things are going to be taken on notice and or I'll add them in. Okay, so let's move by Councillor Milani and seconded by Councillor Javier. Yes, just in on. the workshop, this is a pretty important workshop, I, I believe. Um, two things. One is my question around, um, I'd like to see a bit of work to be done, my question around the budgeting. It's a five year strategy. And I want some information on, um, hypothetically, let's say that it's budgeted for $200,000 a year for five years, which is a million dollars over five years. Hypothetically, what would be the business case if we spent a million in year one and amortised the asset over five years? That, that's my first question, because we could get bigger bang and, and um, Christmas decorations are an asset like any other piece of equipment that we have. And my second question will be, uh, can the, uh, in that workshop also please, it talks about the tender process has been improved because it moved from June to March. It's still actually not enough time, and I want the workshop to please include how we are starting the tender process right now, this month, for 2017. Thanks, Councillor While we've got administration's attention on this, anyone else got any other things I'd like included in the briefly that they'd like included in the consider uh, uh, that brought back to us as part of that um, workshop? That be, with all due respect, won't that be the purpose of the workshop? Yeah, but if we can give the I'm we can, asking those topics to be included. Just what, what gets included. So anyone else want to add anything in to include? Councillor Abbott. Uh, the one thing I was actually going to bring up was what Councillor Malani was saying in relation to the funding when, when we moved this was don't restrict yourself to the million or the 200,000. Let's just think outside the square and think from an economic and return economic perspective as well. So that's something that I'm quite uh, interested in. Thanks. Councillor Wilkinson, did you have your hand up as well? No. No? Anyone else got any comments? No? Otherwise, we are happy then to put that. Anyone want to say anything else or sum up, Councillor Malani? Summed up. Sum okay, can I put that? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Now that does bring us to item 12, which is the out of session information papers to note and Councillor Wilkinson will be called that out. Yes, I just wanted to speak to that in relation to the uh, Adelaide Central Market. So, so, do you want to move it? Uh, yes. Okay, um, so moved by Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Malani, um, and uh, Councillor Wilkinson, you're just going to speak to it. If I may. Um, um, if I could get clarification from the administration, it's my understanding that a uh, out of session paper 
that is put to council in this format, that there is no opportunity for us as the council to make any amendment. All we have option to do is to note, and that is all we have the option to do. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's what we moved. Yeah. That's what an So that's the intent of the other session papers, are just to inform us about things, yeah? Yeah. So I just wanted to express my view that I was um, dismayed at some of the graphics presented in the um, central market um, uh, out of session paper that convey um, the replacement of the uh, Grote Street Coles facade with a with a some modern facade that looks a bit like the bus station. It's much like a repeat of the mistake of the 60s, and then it also depicted um, the Moores building, uh, which had a magnificent dome on the top, but for technical reasons that the dome was rebuilt after a fire, is not here, it's listed, and then that was proposed to be demolished and replaced with some excrescence coming over the top of it. And I'm just expressing my, you know, I've some, I'm, I'm understand because the, uh, a um, out of session paper, I can't do anything about it, but I'm just absolutely dismayed that that is what's being put out there as council's vision for the for the central market, basically raping a heritage building, being the Moore's building, with an absolute ab abortion on top of it, um, and and doing completely the wrong thing on Grove Street, and then that's being put forward as our vision, one of the most significant projects that we're doing, and. Um, uh, and I, I resent the fashion that this is put to us as an out of session paper where we uh, can't actually um, really, all we can do is note the paper. And even if, if, even if it's uh, abhorrent to us, um, we, 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 all we can do is note it. And, and I'm very disappointed as an elected member that I'm in that position, that all, all I can do is, is note and can't do anything about um, that being put out. And, and it certainly does not reflect um, what I and, and I think a majority of councils express the sort of vision that we want to put out for what we want to see on the central market. It might have expressed the vision of what particular architects who are on the case wanted to see, but certainly doesn't express our vision. And um, um, uh, so I'm, uh, that's why I've called it out just so that I could make, make that point. And it's certainly um, not how I would like our um, vision for the market. It should, should be a very positive thing rather than us uh, making us look like hypocrites. Thanks, Councillor Wilkinson. Just to, to clarify that, that was a previous paper that was just being commented on, mm. so it really had to go in mm. in that format because that's what mm. the previous paper was all mm. about. And I think um, you probably, I know a number of others, others expressed the view at the time, so, um, uh, and I think it's it right that a number of councillors, it's, it's clearly not the council's vision for that area, it's just an artist's impression of something happening there. But the administration wished to speak to this as well. Well, through you, Chair, I think you've really answered the situation. I'll clarify the situation. Simply, if an elected member isn't happy with the paper that's formally endorsed by council, a motion or notice to change um, can be can be considered. It is conceptual only. It is illustrated only, and the message has not lost on us as, as administration. So, if, but if, if elected members feel passionate enough to demand a change, a motion or notice to do so is something that would be required because as administration, we can't simply change and endorse the position of council. Oh, well, thank you, C. I'll, I'll, I'll take your advice and I'll, I'll, um, I'll move the motion for motion at the next opportunity to change those images completely. Thank you. Okay, so we've got Councillor Milani, a seconder, Councillor Martin, Councillor Moran. Councillor Martin? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Chair. Look, I, I endorse the, uh, uh, the comments of uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, there is a problem with the document to which he's referring in that there is some sense within the administration that this document was approved by this council. It was not. Certainly not the illustrations that have been included in that document. Um, additionally, I think the point that uh, Councillor Wilkinson makes is that there is an expectation created by that kind of information an expectation within the community. And indeed, there are a whole series of discussions occurring about the central market at this time, almost in parallel to whatever happens in council. There is, for example, 
uh, you would be aware, uh, a discussion about a, uh, a food culture centre to be incorporated in the central market arcade and central market uh, strategy. Now, this has not come to council. It flows from some other discussion within the administration, which has gone to a workshop, which has included representatives of the state government, the museums, the history society, the premier's department. We've not been involved in that in any way. Now, I understand that it's very conceptual stuff that's being dealt with, but it is something that ought to have come here first. And the thing that I, I also have a problem with is that the, the, the paper we're being asked uh, to note also notifies us about things such as uh, the governance model, which was touched on uh, during a meeting of uh, the Lord Mayor's um, business group uh, last week, or was it this week? No, last week. Uh, the model was presented to the business group, but it hasn't been presented to us. And, and it contains a lot of information that we ought to be aware of, not least that the Capital City Committee is central to the governance program. Now, Councillor Mark, can I interrupt you? Because it's just been pointed out to me that this doesn't relate at all to the motion before us which is to accept and receive a note out of session papers uh, related what, to the market district. Yes, it does, it does, Chair. What I'm, what I'm coming to conclude okay, to say, please, go ahead. I am concluding uh, by saying the problem with all of this is that it is then cited, as indeed was uh, the case in an email that came round to us. These uh, out of session papers are cited as, I think the expression was, touch points with council. They are no such thing. They are simply papers that set out a position <laughs> and information in the hands of the administration and there is no opportunity for us to discuss them. Now, I'm not going to move that we uh, somehow reject this, but I am asking that there be some discussion with this council about all of these elements, not a workshop in confidence, but something within council that everybody can have access to so that the full discussion reflects the importance of this institution to the citizens of Adelaide, the ratepayers of Adelaide, and the people of South Australia, not this sort of parallel universe that we're enduring at the moment. So, Councillor Martin, um, uh, I've got a request from our administration to make some comments on that, and then I've got two more speakers. Um, just Yes, thank you, through the Chair. Um, as the CEO mentioned, the, the comments are not lost in the administration. Um, what I can say is um, I'm actually quite pleased that there's this level of interest because we've got a CEO's um, briefing next week. Um, my observation since I've been here is that CEO briefings um, are sometimes poorly attended. I'd encourage all councillors to come next week because that will be the opportunity to talk through some of the issues that have been raised in relation to the Central Markets Arcade. Um, as um, has been um, provided previously, there will be a number of stages of the uh, redevelopment and council will have the opportunity to input into each and every one of those stages. So the workshop as early as next Tuesday will provide the opportunity to have some of these discussions um, um, debated with then a report to a September committee meeting and, and council. So um, the, the opportunity is imminent to have um, the discussion around some of these matters. Okay, members, with that in mind, and given that we're just noting out of session papers, Councillor Moran and Councillor Abbey. Look, I think sometimes the councillors' views are lost um, on, uh, on what comes on the... Um, papers. I mean, this is the, we've, we've had a few workshops, we've had quite a few discussions, and Sandy has barely drawn breath about the tension of the arches. He has said it so many times, over and over again, and the Moors died, which I was, that was heritage desert. He could not have said it and brought it to the attention of the administration more often. So, I'm sorry, but I think our, our, I don't like this way of um, these papers coming just to be noted. Um, there you go. Um, um, and us not being able to say, say anything about them. I would like the, the um, administration to prepare a motion on notice that um, the drawings of the, that be altered to include options for the retention of the arches. Not so worried about the domes, I don't think they're... Councillor Moran, this is something you need to take up with the administration outside of the meeting. What we're doing at the moment is debating whether we receive or not these out-of-session papers. I take your point. I think, that, I think the room takes your point, but it's if you're wanting to shape up a motion on, uh, on notice, I think Councillor 
uh, Wilkinson's indicated he already intends to do yes. that uh, um, session. So we've got next Tuesday for that. We've got a, we've, we've, by that stage, we will have been briefed. Councillor Abbey, unless you want to say anything more, Councillor McCormick. <laughs> Councillor Abbey, sorry. But... Thank you, Look, I just wanted to briefly note uh, also the report and receive it for the ad session papers in relation to the food truck. Uh, food truck and SA position paper. I just wanted to note um, for members very briefly, um, which I would like to quickly just read uh, one sentence that uh, since um, basically the program success over the last six months, we had a minimal transition issues from previous to current guidelines, increased usage and patronage of city squares. Uh, we have had the entrepreneur category, which is a new one, has received the highest level of interest that attracts ongoing entrepreneurs that are interested in that program. We have minimal amounts of complaints. Uh, we have also minimal issues that the administration was unable to resolve in comparison to previous positions that we've had. Uh, we have had the administration be approached by two proponents that are interesting, interested in a permanent food truck location that they're investigating. And also, there's a note here from administration that they are concerned with the distinct lack of clarity provided in the position paper of some key operating elements critical to the future success of the mobile food vending, that's the South Australian government's paper, including permit numbers and costs, food safety management, criteria for approval of trade. Thus, it's not possible to confirm a position of support until many of those questions in the areas of uncertainty have been clarified by the state government. So I just wanted to note that for the sake of this meeting. It's a good line in the sand for a comparison to perhaps what the position will be in 12 months' time. Um, Councillor Martin? Yeah, just a, uh, a question, Chair. A question, Chair, related to the other session paper related to the city shopper survey. And I, I'm not, I'm hoping I'm not going to dislodge the Lord Mayor and Councillor Blani from their chairs. But given that the findings suggest pretty much that uh, young people, students, and uh, what I used to call dinks, double income, no kids, are apparently, according to this survey, the main shoppers within the uh, the mall, and moreover, that parking is such a determinant, apparently, where the people shop, whether it is likely that this 450 person, 415 person survey uh, will lead to more detailed research because the findings are really quite uh, extraordinary. Question for administration. Anyone want to comment on that or do you want to take that question on notice? So the question is, is there going to be some follow-up research to the Adelaide City Shopper Survey 2016? Yeah, but the point being that some of those results deserve further investigation. I'm just asking whether they will affect. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll speak to the same item as Councillor Martin. Um, now, this is this forms part of the uh, various deliverables of the Adelaide Retail Strategy Experience Adelaide. Chair, to my understanding, quest, question for administration is that we are expecting a full detailed annual report with KPIs for Experience Adelaide um, post 30 June for last financial year. Question to administration, when will we receive that? Do we have any takers to answer that question? <laughs> so, uh, that one probably sits with me. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take that one on notice because I don't have the answer to that question top of top of head. Sorry, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Justin. I brought that to our attention because members, you may recall that approximately March or April this year, we were provided with an interim report regarding the retail strategy. In that time, we were told that we would have a full annual report of its progress to date for the previous financial year soon after 30 June. So thanks, Justin. I appreciate that coming back to the members at some point soon. Members, any further comments or questions in relation to the other session papers? Um, uh, Councillor Wilkinson, do you wish to sum up or can we put it? Uh, just to sum up, I think as, as Councillor Moran said, I don't think I could have made it plainer in terms of intention. And I think the majority of council shared my views, yet none of that seemed to be reflected in, in that out of session report that you know on on the market that's that's come through. And, and I think that um, um, we we do need to think about this whole process of out of session papers and whether really that is a good good modus operandi or whether they should just be items items on the agenda. Um, 
rather than dealt with in that fashion. Members can I put to that um, item 12, all those in favour, all those against, item 12 is carried. Um, brings us to item 13, any other business? Um, and we have an, ex uh, an exclusion uh, motion yeah. put by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Antic. Do we have any discussion on the exclusion motion? Can I put it, all those in favour? That's carried. So um, all members, can I ask all members of the public and members of our administration who are not directly associated with item 15 to leave the room and call for the, uh, the doors to be closed. But members, um, this relates to...
Oops. Just before we close the meeting, uh, did you want to add a comment? Through the chair, I just wanted to um, go back on some of the comments. I think an opportunity to early on in relation to the out of session papers. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is rich in the process at the moment. It wouldn't be appropriate right now to do that. That's the advice I've received. So it's probably best to feedback through um, uh, Judy because there was no other items to consider on the agenda at this stage. So it's best that we we'll probably feed it back through uh, to the CEO if that's okay. Sorry. But so with that, I declare the meeting closed. Um, can I please ask for the Deputy Lord Mayor back in this? So I've closed the meeting for you, Deputy Lord Mayor. So yeah, we want no workshop meetings. No, we're just So members, we're going to get started straight away on the Finance and Business Services Committee. So I declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting reopened on Tuesday the 16th of August 2016 at 7.16pm. And uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that the Finance and Business Services meeting it is uh, being held on a traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that we pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge their continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Uh, we have on lead Councillor Corbell and Councillor Virchall. And can I have someone move on to three the confirmation of the minutes by Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Milani. Any debate? Be it none, I'll put those minutes to you. All those in favour? All those against? The minutes are confirmed. Members, we don't have a public forum at this stage, and I move on to item five. And just a, a brief reminder that we've gone back live and we are now back streaming on the internet. So there is no chair's verbal report. I'll move to item six, to moving items on block. We have a workshop on item seven that I will uh, take out of the mix. Item eight, infrastructure asset management plans. Councillor Martin. Item nine, the 15-16 prelim end of year financial performance report. Councillor Martin. 10, amendment to the declaration of the Rundle Moore differential separate rate levy, 16-17, that's been withdrawn for conflict. Item 11, end of quarter 4, 2015-16 integrated business plan. And then out of session papers, uh, out of session information papers to note in item 12. Excellent. So members, can I have someone uh, move items nine? No, nine is oh, you moved. So we'll, sorry, just items eleven and twelve. Then in that case, excellent. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Moran. Any debate? All those in favour? All those against? Those items are carried. Um, we, before I actually um, go to the workshop, I might deal with these items and then go back to the workshop while I've got attention to members and hopefully we can deal with this as quickly as possible. So I'll take on item eight first, the infrastructure asset management plans. Councillor Martin. Okay, so you, uh, you're dealing with it all uh, out of order. Sorry? Dealing with it out of order. I'm going to deal with the motions first. Yes. I'm going to deal with the, uh, with the items first. Okay, sure. Let me just go forward. So, Councillor Martin, before you proceed, sorry, I missed this one, it's my fault. The infrastructure asset plan management plan is actually a workshop, so I, I didn't mention to withdraw it earlier in item seven. Oh, is it? Okay. No. So, what I'm going to do is uh, go back to item seven and deal with the workshop first, since we have two workshops. Oh, or, no, it doesn't say that on the agenda. Chair, does this just a brief? Oh, you're right. It is workshop and item for consideration and recommendation of council. Okay. Infrastructure program, infrastructure asset plan management. I missed that line. Apologies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a couple of things here. I might as well actually deal quickly with item nine and ten, and then we go to both workshops and our way we're done. Yep. So, item nine, councillor, 15 16 prelim end of year financial performance report. You withdrew that, councillor Martin. Um, yes, I did. There are a, a couple of questions I wanted to ask. So would you move it as printed first? And yeah, yeah, sure. Happy so time. I have members a motion uh, to to support the recommendation of item 9. 
Can I have a second, Dan, members? Sorry, Deputy Lord Mayor. So, Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Um, that works. Good. I have a couple of questions of the administration related to it. Um, on um, uh, slide 8, R169, $30,000 was allocated last financial year for road design in Jeffcott Street. Was the work anticipated this financial year or, or um, was it actually intended? Uh, when I say this financial year, I meant 15, 16, or was it actually intended for 16, 17? Yeah. So, Councillor, do you have clarity on that? Yes. So, the art hasn't been asked. Yep. Uh, through the chair, uh, Jeffcott Street uh, was a design project. So, uh, we've actually got uh, a number of years of design and planning uh, ready for construction in the future years. So, there's. Uh, oh, no, it's working. Okay. Um, so, we will spend the money, or we're supposed to spend the money in 15, 16, we'll now spend it in 16, 17, and there will be a project at some stage in the future. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, that is correct. It's in our three year plan uh, to do a construction project in Jeffcott Street on drainage, curbing, roadways, and streetscape, uh, subject to council approval. Okay, uh, and so that means basically it will have to be brought into council. Okay, thank you. Um, another funny. Um, on um, uh, slide 11, $101,000 has been allocated for P335 for uh, future use of parkland. Councillors, can we please pay attention to Councillor Martin's question? Um, uh, allocated for future use of parklands building subject to a council decision after an APLA recommendation to remove the council nursery. Has APLA made that decision? Thank you very much. What can I, can I explain? Oh, my, are you asking this question of an APLA member or the administration at the moment? I'm asking it of the administration, but if Councillor okay. Moran is over. So let that me that. try to get an answer from the administration first, and if the administration can't assist, I'll refer to Councillor Moran for you. Through you, Chair, thank you. Um, Councillor, a decision has not been made to remove the nursery or indeed to leave the nursery where it is. Um, decision was made um, at APLA, I think the most recent APLA meeting, um, in regard to the work at the current nursery site, uh, in regard to drainage to ensure um, compliance with our EPA licence and any future development works at the nursery have not yet been decided upon or been recommended upon. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's good. That's not $100,000, Mark. You'll be happy. Um, uh, and uh, don't count on it. <laughs> Councillor Martin, through the chair. And uh, yes, through you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to also ask about the Hindley Street toilets. I didn't understand that. A, a quarter of a million in carry forwards. And can I have the 30 second explanation of why we can't spend them? Uh, through you, Chair, yes, the um, Highland Street public conveniences um, were planned to be completed. However, due to some um, issues that arose when we looked at the adjacent party wall uh, to an adjoining building um, through an engineering assessment through the design phase, um, we had to put that project on hold uh, to assess the, the safety of the adjoining party wall um, and enter into some discussions with the adjoining landowner on that regard. So the project had to be had to be delayed. Okay. So, all right. Sorry, I just couldn't understand, Chair, from the papers. Um, and, and just finally, from uh, uh, the administration again, um, what is the based on the final page? What is the projected borrowings now for 2016-17? That is the total projected borrowings. <laughs> The uh, <coughs> through the chair, uh, through which page? Sorry. Oh, it's uh, the last page. Yeah. 
last year. Through the chair, the projected borrowings is now uh, 41 million. That includes all of the, the uh, items that have gone through in the 16-17 uh, inflation. Sorry. So the sum total of our indebtedness as a council in 16 and 17 is projected to be $41 million. Oh, sorry. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Okay, I understand. Any other questions, Councillor Martin? Ah, works. Um, uh, no, not really. There were a couple of comments I had. I can leave those until some other point in this discussion if you prefer. I can. No, so we've um, got a motion here that you've moved and it was seconded already. So you are entitled to speak to it, or I'll ask someone else to speak and then I'll ask you to sum up. Um, oh, well, I don't care. I'm happy if somebody else wishes okay, so to speak. Does anyone like to speak to Lord Mayor? Speaking to item nine. Thank you, um, Chair. I'd just like to uh, speak in um, slide number 15 in your papers, members, uh, sets out some of the efficiency gains uh, that our CEO has been quietly achieving on behalf of the corporation. I'd just like to commend the CEO, the finance team and the entire team for the work that's been done. So, um, well done. And I, I note there um, that uh, a third of those uh, gains were achieved as a result of we're probably not drawing down as much debt that we had anticipated during the previous financial year. And uh, 1.5 million, I understand, Mark, we've saved and projected at least interest costs. Is that my understanding? Just turn off the mic. Uh, that, through the chair, that's correct. Okay, so I, I don't need to debate the matter. The numbers are self-evident. Just wanted to extend congratulations to the team. It looks like the uh, will of the council has been reflected to the leadership of the CEO. So thank you. Any other comments, Councillor? Just to just to endorse that, to say great great achievement, and it just I think vilifies this council's um, decision to freeze rates this year, which yeah. uh, I think is a very you know very great commitment. Um, Lost for words um, <laughs> uh, in admiration. Um, so, but not surprised. But not surprised, no. Well done. <laughs> Excellent. Any other comments, members? If there's none, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. And look, I endorse that. Um, uh, point five, as the administration observes, um, uh, suggests that this is a good outcome. It is indeed a good outcome. And everybody does deserve a pat on the back. Um, and the administration, I might add, has set a wonderful example by reducing travel expenditure from 183 to 83,000. That's sensational. Great example to us all. Uh, and I note that a review of the 2017-18 uh, the budget is due, um, the process, and I look forward to that. Um, and I just remind everybody that uh, the uh, the infrastructure projects which we've been approving have led to a, a blowout in our debt, uh, $41 million for 2015, uh, 16, 17, and the papers demonstrate that we'll have another $13 million in 17, 18 before we even start. The sum total is $53, $54 million. Am I correct in that? Through the chair, there is uh, some further uh, borrowings in, in relation to the city transformation projects in the 17-18 uh, budget. That's correct. Yeah. So essentially, we start 17-18 pretty much um, committed, uh, and I really think it's important for uh, councillors to remember that. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Members, I'll put that to you. All those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. All recommendations carried. Item uh, 10, I will ask quickly um, the Ward Mayor and also Council Malani to state their conflict and leave the room so members can deal with that item. Uh, well, I don't actually think I have one, but um, the <laughs> advice is that because this is a, a rate that ultimately goes back to the authority okay. conflict of interest, so I'll <laughs> declare that I'm on the Rundle Management. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Lord Mayor. I would think I would say it's a, it's a tenuous one, I must say, Chair. I've got to say we're board members and authority, but this is a rating issue. I don't see the conflict, but if the chair decides so, the, uh, uh, the, the conflict sits with you, Lord Mayor. It's not my decision. I shop in London. Uh, 
Well, that's probably I'm the same I'm level. I'm happy to test it. I'd be happy to test it and stay in the room, Chair. I think this is a very tenuous oh. link. Oh. Members, members, members. Huh? It's the decision, members, it's the decision of members to call a conflict if they choose to stay in the room. Members, I'm um, pleased. If it's completely, entirely up to you to make that decision, and it's only your call. And actually, it's also up to the obligation of our, my fellow councillors to give their tell me if they think I've got it. That's not. I mean, that is not. That is. But I mean, I this is this is a. Um, We've got a conflict. This is this is a. Councillor Maloney, there is no debate. It's either you're in conflict and you leave, or you're not. No, no, there is no say. I just need to understand: Are you in conflict or are you not? There is no other reason. I don't think I am, but I'm going to leave anyway. Okay, so you're leaving the room, Lord Mayor. Uh, Chair, I don't believe I am in conflict in this matter, and I'm going to stay in the room. Okay, so the Lord Mayor chooses to stay in the room. Ooh. Okay, members here. So we've got uh, item 10 to do with amendment to the declaration of one more differential separate rate. 1617, can I have a mover? Moved by the Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Moran. Deputy Lord Mayor, that was that your right? Councillor Moran. Any debate, members? Be it that there's none, back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Summed up. I put that to you, all those in favour, all those against, that item is carried. If I can have Councillor Milani, please come back in the room. Good, you can't hear us with the test. <laughs> Members, we've dealt with item 11 and 12, so I will move back to item 7. We have a brief workshop on the Local Government Association um, Annual General Meeting. Notices of motion from this council to that AGM. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Through the chair, may we, can I begin? Please do. Okay. Um, so this is an item that was carried over from a couple of weeks ago. On the 2nd of August, there was an opportunity to talk about some motions and notices put to the LGA AGM. Um, and the decision was made to bring it back into a workshop tonight. So here we are. Um, I guess the fundamental context is you have the opportunity to put notices and motions to the LGA AGM. It's coming out in October. <laughs> If you want to do so, you need to advise the LGA by the 9th of September, which is pretty soon. Um, the other piece of context is that this is your way to sort of make a statement about things you care about that are relevant to local government in general. So the material that you've got tonight talks about three notices of motion that were discussed much earlier this year and deferred, as well as a couple of other items that administration put together for the purpose of discussion. I don't propose to go through the slides one by one. It's um it's all in front of you in terms of what the propositions are. If only I could find my copy. So the first one is about electronic voting at local government for a local government election beginning in 2018. Um, there was some background material presented in the material you received in the agenda. But if there's anything else you, you know, if you would like to know, then ask away. Um, fundamentally, what I'm thinking is it, it's, this is something that you, you said in March that you wanted to reconsider. If that's still the case, is this still of interest? So the way I'm going to conduct these members to make it easy, uh, there are three specific motions that we are considering uh, of putting forth to the AGM. So what we'll do is, firstly, I'll open the floor to any questions relating to the specific motion. So we are dealing currently with the voting. So I'm happy to take a few questions in that regard. And then we will move to either have that endorsed and put forward as a position of this council or not. So we've got the Deputy Lord Mayor a question on e-voting. Actually, it's not a question, it's a comment. I'd prefer, I'd, ex I'd be keen to put this up right if, it, if we change the word from adopt to consider. Um, well, I think we have to have it. I think, that That's, to I think what we've got on there at the moment, uh, you are welcome, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, to move an amendment to this current uh, to this current item. Is, that, is, is that it as formal as that? I thought we were just. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accept. If you're not asking questions, I will accept it as a motion. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. 
Okay, well, I'm not moving it. Okay, so at the moment, still in questions. I'm moving it. You are moving? Yep. So I've got the Councillor Malani moving to change the word no. adopt. No. 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 Uh, as is? <laughs> okay, so moved as is. Do I have a seconder? And Councillor Slama. Councillor Malani, you have the floor. We've had a, we've had a fair bit of um, uh, debate about this. I don't, did we actually vote on it last time? Yes. I think. No. So um, I think because I chaired the no, meeting, Council but. Um, I think this is just asking for all of the stakeholders to come together to, uh, well, it, it, it's to it's, move it's, to electronic. Yeah, that's, it's hard, but there's, there's going to be a process to it. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's not just going to happen overnight and bingo, it's going to be electronic voting. I think that we should push them to test their thinking on this. And um, I think we should not have put anything up that's wishy washy. Let's test the um, let's test the uh, local government community on it. Thank you, Councillor Malani. Councillor Sala. Reserve your right. Reserve your right. So uh, we've got Councillor Martin followed by Councillor Moran. Yeah, look, I think we should. Sorry, put, apologies. Yeah. That's okay. I think we should put this up, if only to give the local government association a good belly laugh. It is only a matter of days since the Australian Bureau of Statistics, <laughs> the combined might. The yeah. Commonwealth Government, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, yeah. oh, Defence Intelligence oh, Organisations yeah. and IBM demonstrated that online communication with punters does not work. It was subjected to uh, claims of cyber attacks, poor decision making and ultimately in any case the plug was pulled. To be suggesting that we should try the same thing would be a great idea. It would commit e-voting to I guess uh, just a, a memory. There is no way that anyone could seriously submit this so close to the collapse of the Australian census. Councillor Moran. I'm oh, sorry, it was the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Moran. Apologies, Councillor. Well, I would like to move that the word be changed from adopt to consider. If somebody would like to second it, then don't, then I'll just vote against it. There's no okay. second to Councillor. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I won't be supporting this. I agree with what Phil was saying. Um, when we put motions up to, to this, it should be well thought out, ones that can be actioned. And this really, uh, there will be a time, but recent events have shown that we're, we're not there yet. And a census is one thing, but a vote, I mean, I didn't care whether they knew what my census form, but I really didn't care what, what I, uh, if they knew what I voted for. It's a far more sensitive area. So I think we just can't put silly motions up willy nilly if we want to be taken seriously. Uh, I prefer we just put one really good motion up, and uh, or none if we haven't got either. We're unhappy about, but I definitely recommend to vote against this in its current form. Councillors, any other debate? Councillor, can I just ask a point of clarification? This, yes. This e can you use your mic, please, Councillor. Um, this question. This this e voting was just the first of three things to be discussed as part of this. If we each only have one opportunity to speak, how are we to consider the latter two items? I'm doing it separately, Councillor. Oh, right. Okay, thank you. Right. Just one second. So, Councillor Slava, you happy? Uh, Councillor Malani. Thank you. Uh, look, this uh, motion doesn't say online. There are many ways to look at e-voting. Um, India, half a billion people vote electronically. And it's not done online. So there's different, it doesn't say online, but there is many um, uh, ways you can look at e-voting. So I urge us to try and make a change. Members, I'll put that uh, to recommend this to the AGM. All those in favour of this motion? Thank you. All those against? So, uh, sorry, you need to be sitting in the chair, Councillor. So, I have to repeat the vote. All those in favour of that motion? One, two, three, four, five. All those against? Two, three, four, five. So, lost on the equality of votes. So, we move to the next motion, teleworkers. Do I have a motion, mover of the motion or an alternate recommendation? Members, do I have a mover of the current motion or an alternate recommendation at this stage? No mover and no alternate recommendation. So I'm recommend, I'm recommending that this will not be included to the AGM. Can I just make a comment about it? 
just in a second. Is that the recommendation that we will not include it? So I can ask someone to move that this will not be included. Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Antic. I'm guessing you don't wish to speak to that, Councillor. Councillor uh, Antic, Deputy Lord Mayor, if you wish to speak. I guess my, I just wanted to make the point. It's not that we're, that I'm not supporting because I don't like <laughs> telework and we don't think that that might be a good opportunity. But I, I think it's just something that each council needs to decide for itself. I don't think it's really our business to be telling people how to run their business. So we just leave them to it. Councillor, yep, Councillor Clara had Can I just say that we do need to be considered in what we put up to the LGA. I mean, I, I think we had very little success last time. And um, here's another example. And one of the comments made by a mayor of a metropolitan council was, you don't need our permission to do this. Go ahead and do it yourself. So I think here's another example of where we don't need to ask for permission. Let's do it if we're that committed. Excellent. Councillor Moran, sum up. Summed up. I put this to not be recommended. All those in favour? All those against? This will not be recommended. We're moving to item three. Uh, vote at the age of 16. Can I, Councillor Moran? I vote that we don't do this. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Wilkinson. And the reason I don't is because uh, we should, in all cases, try to. Um, Keep, keep the same claims all as federal and state government. 16 year olds um, are not considered um, adults then, so um, nothing against 16 year olds, but my experience with my 16 year olds wasn't vote, anywhere near a voting poll. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to leave this one out. It wouldn't get up anyway. Councillor Wilkinson? Look, Chair, I, I endorse that. The state and federal government uh, uh, standard is 18 years of age. If local government then breaks away from that nexus, then we need to maintain our own electoral roles. And that becomes an enormous expense uh, uh, for councils to go out and identify which 16 and 17 year olds are eligible to vote. Um, when indeed just sticking with the standard ensures that there's an efficiency, uh, a system in place that has integrity and not something that requires enormous effort and expense on the, uh, the part of local government. It just doesn't make sense to be presenting ourselves with an unnecessary burden. Councillor uh, Clare. It's an interesting situation. Um, asked me as a 16 year old whether I'd like to vote, I would have loved to. However, um, given that 25% of our population in the city of Adelaide are international students and who are eligible to vote in city council elections if they're prepared to register uh, and combined with, uh, with this motion, well, hang on to your seats. It could be big changes at the next election if this is endorsed. Other comments? Yeah, Members, I might just seek quickly, this is something I'm a little bit passionate about, so I might make a quick comment, if that's okay. Um, look, I think there's been many occasions at which local government leads the debate and the discussion when it comes to these issues, and then we will see the change that occur on a state and federal level. I think it's very appropriate for a capital city to have those considerations in place, to lobby for them. By all means, we might not have the means to deliver them, uh, but eventually we might get there. Yeah. We are trying to pitch ourselves as a city that's cosmopolitan, attracting the young. And if you want the young to stay in South Australia and be part of South Australia, they need to be part of the decision-making process. And that is the reality. Uh, there are kids out there now that are 12, 13, 14, 15, that are probably more informed on a lot of current issues uh, than many people that are completely unplugged. They've got access to social media. I used to ask my dad about what's right and wrong. Now Google tells me. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we need to acknowledge the power of the youth, um, that the world is changing around us. And I would ask members that, to take that into account in supporting this motion notionally. Probably it will not make it through the uh, LGA AGM, but it, it does put a message out there that the City of Adelaide is interested and open to the ideas of the young, not just by listening, but also by including them in the decision-making process. Councillor Moran, 
Uh, well, I couldn't disagree more. Um, I think 16 is way too young to, to form an opinion. Most people, if they're honest, um, don't vote for council. Now, if, if the feds and the state wanted to, it's compulsory voting is quite different. Um, but ours is the least level of government that should even consider this. Most people, I would, ne I, I, so I would never have bothered to vote for council when I was 16. God's sake, I didn't vote, bother to vote till I was about 36. You worry about councils. People that rent don't worry about the council. Who cares about whether you're rubbish collection? You only really start to vote for council when you buy a house and you start to care about when, how your streets look, when your rubbish is picked up, blah, blah. So if you raise the voting age to 25, you probably wouldn't, you'd still have the same number of people voting as you have now. So A, I don't think there'd be one 16 year old in the state that would be possibly interested and if a 16-year-old was interested, I'd be really concerned about that 16-year-old. So, <laughs> so it will be, I think this is a no-go one. Thank you, Councillor Moran. With that, I put this to you. All those in favour of not including this? All those four? Okay, so uh, we have dealt with those three. I think the only recommended at the end, so if Councillor Moran put up, I want to include just one second before you ask your question. Is there anything you wanted to add first to the workshop? Only if you're after some context about the next two proposals. Please is there do. ones that council hasn't seen before? That's correct, so please do. That's recommendations by staff. These are just ideas for your consideration. Um, so we have looked through the strategic plan and there's a particular action in our new strategic plan around green procurement. Um, so a suggestion is that um, you might like to consider putting forward a motion to the LGA AGM that would take up that theme. Um, the wording up there basically to encourage all South Australian council procurement practices to reasonably require a couple of particular items which are mentioned in the action in our strategic uh, in our strategic plan. Um, so I'll do I'll do with that item first. So in relation to the Green Procurement members, can I have someone move that? Moved by the Lord Mayor. Is there a second there, please, for that motion? Second by Councillor Martin. Lord Mayor, would you, do you wish to speak? I'll speak to that briefly. Um, Chair, I'll just look at the practical implications of that, because I think notionally it's a very good idea. Um, <clears throat> we wouldn't want that to inadvertently, of course, have drastic cost implications for small business and a range of other unintended knock-on effects. So I might just take some advice from administration, because I know we've had similar but different debates about motions like this that uh, could have impacts upon business. So could I look to the CEO for some direction? But uh, notionally, I think it's a very good idea and it's something I very much support, but I'd just like to see what that would mean practically. Thank you, CEO. Yeah. Through you, Chair. Look, um, in, in putting this motion to the LGA, the LGA undertakes some research as well. The practicalities of this will be will be determined through the process that we go through. Um, my view is that it is quite a reasonable proposition and and could be could be quite an effective way of progressing our strategic intent. So I, I would think it's a, it's a reasonable proposition, um, and they'll be tested through the LGA process. Are you satisfied with that, Norman? Yep, yeah, I'm satisfied with that. Excellent. Thank you very much. So the second was in. Apologies, was okay. Councillor Martin was the seconder. Reserve my right. Not a problem. So we've got a hand up in Councillor Wilkinson, then also the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Antic. Um, thank you. Um, as a small business owner with two or three staff, um, I'm very conscious of the cost of compliance. I take some comfort in the wording that refers to reasonably require. Um, I mean, when I've previously provided services to the council in the past decades, you know, I've been required to have $10 million of public liability cover and things like that, which is, is understandable, but, but um, uh, uh, and it's important that if this was adopted, that it's done sensibly and so that it just doesn't become uh, a bureaucratic um, in, impediment to small business. I mean, I've got enough things to do of a day as a small business person with two or three staff than, than to deal with kind of this sort of thing. So it really needs to just be reserved to larger contracts of some environmental significance and not, not just sort of another layer of, of 
uh, of red tape for, for small businesses to, to have to deal with and just makes it hard to do business with council. So, so as long as that word reasonably is, is very reasonably applied, <coughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Thank you, Charles Wilkinson. Deputy Lord Mayor Hinder. Yeah, I, I also have a slight difficulty with it. It's to, it's to do particularly with the language. I, I, I agree with the intent, which is that they have, you know, we are, we're suggesting that all councils, all councils consider their green procurement practices. It's just that we've selected two particular ways of dealing with it. Um, and I'm a bit uncomfortable with us being so precise about how they might um, consider their procurement practices. For example, estimates of carbon footprints of products and services, that's actually quite a cumbersome process. And I wonder whether we could just be, I uh, wonder whether the, whoever, I don't know who moved it, sorry, I lost track, whether some, we might just come up with a more general, um, um, so that each council can decide how they address it, um, but that we ask that they all give some reasonable consideration to it. May I suggest with that in that regard, because I'm getting similar sort of feel from different members around their comfort with this motion. Uh, just quickly to the CEO, does this council currently have a position on what they would like to do when it comes to green Possibly that might be something that that's we need to do. This, is, this comes out of our strategic plan. I can answer that question. This is our strategic plan. That's correct. This is how we have decided that we will address yeah. green procurement. That's right. I, what I'm suggesting is that we shouldn't be telling other councils how they should address procurement, green procurement. They might yeah. want to use some other tests or yeah. methods. Can we just encourage all the suffering councils? So, uh, Deputy Lord, Councillor yeah. Malani, please. Councillor Malani. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to make a change? Well, I'm, I would either yes, move an amendment or perhaps the mover and seconder, whoever they were, might consider a variation to just generalise it a bit. So I just need to be able to formulate a... Members, please, councillor, councillors, please, the Deputy Lord Mayor is more than capable of formulating a response. Okay, then I will amend it, if that's what you want me to do, that uh, to change it to environmental procurement practices. So just put in the word environmental procurement practice. To encourage all South Australian councils to use environment, to adopt environmental procurement practices. Uh, reasonable. Uh, yeah. Full stop. Uh, Lord Mayor, do you wish to take this on board or do you want to have and a Delete the rest. Yeah. And delete the rest. Then they can decide which procurement practices they want to adopt. Oh, I asked the chair. Please, uh, there's a process. Let's stick to the process. Chair, I asked you a question. I'm not sure if this is an amendment or a variation, but if it was a variation, I'd accept that as a variation. I think that's quite reasonable. Okay, so I have a. The Lord Mayor is happy to accept that variation. In Councillor Martin, the second, are you prepared to accept that variation? I agree with the Lord Mayor. That is very rare. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, members, can I seek leave to vary, please? All in favour of the variation? All against? So the variation now is as it stands. Councillor Clarahan, you had your hand up. Would you like to speak? Yes, I think this is another example of our city council telling other councils how to suck eggs. And it doesn't go down well, I have to say. I think we're better off actually saying that the annual general meeting requests the Local Government Association to investigate ways in which councils can adopt Benefit. environmental <laughs> procurement practices because we've got some very small councils. So you're moving that, Councillor? Yeah. Well, I'd like, I'm happy for others to accept it, yep. to vary it, but um, I just think we've got to so stop. Councillor, just, just to get clarity, I'm sorry, okay. I'm just trying to guide process here to inform uh, council of a good decision. Uh, are you wanting to vary it by uh, the above that the annual general meeting requests the local government association investigate ways in which all South Australian councils can adopt? Can you please? Yep. Can adopt? Yeah, good idea. Environmental procurement policy practices. Are you are you happy with that, councillor? And I would take out. I don't know whether we want all, because that's again just red ragging to a ball, saying that Adelaide City Council knows how to do this stuff. You know, Councillor, please let me just get clarity on what's the on the board first. Okay. Okay. So take out all. Take out all. Lord Mayor, prepared to accept that second variation. Happy to accept that second variation. Councillor Martin, you agree with the Lord Mayor? I still agree with that. Uh, <laughs> Councillors, can I please seek leave to vary the current recommendation motion? Thank you very much. That is very. 
Uh, Councillor Antic, you yes, have your hand you, up. Chair. Thank you, yes. I have. I, I, um, there's an old, I've used football analogies twice tonight. I'll use another one now. The, the old suggestion is, is a week is a long time in football. It seems like a month is a long time in, uh, in city council terms. It's only about a month ago that we had the infamous, what had been dubbed Dunnygate scandal of the $750,000 toilet block in, in Victoria Park. Um, this is exactly the sort of um, issue I think that we highlighted as a possible reason for our costs being so exorbitant while we end up with $250,000 median strips and um, uh, and uh, I think we had a, I think we put in a graph. Did anyone, has anyone said anything about a green wall? It hasn't got much attention. Um, we put in a green wall, I think, um, for $400,000 and you know, da, 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 da. This is, this is part of the problem, not, not, the, not the exercise. I mean, we, you know, we continue to put these hurdles in. I look, I get it, that's watered down, but I don't see why this has come, I, come to the fore again. We, we, we have done, a month ago, we have done, it, we have essentially looked for ways to overcome these bureaucratic hurdles. And now we're putting more red tape in front of our small businesses and our own, you know, it's just, I, I don't know, I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moran, then followed by Deborah Rubin. Uh, yes, I won't be supporting it either. It's been watered down so much that it's, if this is our only one, I suppose it would be, um, that it, it, it's fairly meaningless now. I think in this day and age, most people try to be more efficient and da da da. Um, but I mean, a far more important one, I'm not going to propose it, would be that uh, we encourage uh, councils to buy locally. Um, so um, this is a, this will create a, a bureaucratic um, uh, component. So I'm just not that interested. We, we, we're doing it ourselves and I think we, we do it very well and we can not cost the ratepayers too much money, fair enough. Um, but lead by exam rather than, as Sue said, telling them what they should do. But it really is such a wishy-washy moment <laughs> now. I think there wouldn't be a council on earth that didn't prefer, if they could, um, to um, have an environmentally um, friendly practice. But I don't think we need to say it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, you've made a, no, a, a assisted in a variation, but you haven't spoken, so Thank you can speak. Yeah, so I, I actually really like it the way it is, because what it's actually doing is encouraging a local government to come up with some ideas that can then be used by all councils, including our council, some suggestions for how we might procure more in a more environmental way, including buying local, because that's one, one procurement policy or procurement um, methodology that is um, has environmental um, consequences. And I think that's exactly what the Local Government Association ought to be doing, and that is resourcing local councils to do what they do better than they currently do it. So that seems to me to be a perfect suggestion that we ask the local government to provide councils, including our own council, with some best practice um, notions about how we environmentally procure. Um, and uh, if you're a small council with small resources, that's a fantastic thing for the local government to give you a list, a list or a, um, a, a sort of template for how you might do that better. Mm. And, and I think us encouraging that across the state, we're wanting to be carbon neutral, is fantastic. Thank you, Councillor. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Martin, you reserved your right because you agree with the Lord Mayor. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm So sure. I might just go back to the Lord Mayor and ask him to sum up. Thank you, Chair. I will sum up. Um, the reason for this, members, I'll encourage you, is that, of course, we have a carbon neutral goal for 2025, but the state of South Australia has a carbon neutral goal for 2050. And uh, leadership like this just begins to move the conversation in a better direction for the entire state. There are 68 councils throughout South Australia, metropolitan and regional, and some of them are extremely well progressed, as, as are some of the well, examples are the Inner Eastern Councils, where we work together on projects, and a number of other councils throughout the state are quite progressed on their sustainability agenda, but others are not. So this is a uh, encouragement to the LGA to play a role here for all councils. Um, and given that it's a clearly stated goal of ours, it's, it's comfortable with our strategic plan, but it's not all about us. Of course, it's about the state. And there are 68 other councils that some have more work to do, some don't. I think it's an important motion. I encourage you to support it. Thank you, councillors. I put this to you. All those in favour? No, All those against? <laughs> that is carried. <laughs> Members, we move to the following, uh, the next recommendation, which is the video conferencing for meetings. Uh, can I have a uh, councillor move? Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded. 
Can I say that? I can't say that. Stephanie by Councillor Slava. Deputy Lord Mayor. Look, I think this is a, again, this, this requires a legislative change, so it is something that we can't do on our own. I mean, uh, so it's, it's asking the state government to make the, the necessary legislative changes to enable us to take advantage of the technology that now exists that didn't exist when the, when the Act was moved. So um, what it's saying is that when we're away um, and there's a meeting on and we want to attend it, we can attend um, electronically. That's, I think, just good common sense given that technology now provides that, that the opportunity for us to do that. I know Councillor Milan is keen that she won't be able to do that so she doesn't have to come when she's on holidays. And I'm not suggesting that when people are on holidays, it's where, because people are entitled to take holidays, they don't necessarily have to participate, but when they're in, in, in circumstances where they can't get here, um, for example, the Lord Mayor might be on business interstate, um, so he could use secure um, video conferencing so that he could um, still make a contribution to the meeting. can't see any good reason why we shouldn't be using technology to help us along. Councillor Slime has a second that. I have definitely supported it, it'll enable us to move into the 22nd century. <laughs> Councillor Brown. I vehemently oppose this. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I other, was once hoping again, the old saying is that the uh, other levels of government do not use that. I've been in um, um, boards that use tele uh, this uh, telecom video conferencing, and it's very distracting. The old adage, I think, is right that you know that decisions are made by her, those who turn up. I don't want to have to go to meetings when I'm on holidays, but there would be a, taking Councillor Milani's point, there would be a, a feeling, a compulsion that you would have to. Um, we just need a quorum. We're no different from every other level of government. Um, it's hard enough keeping councillors in the state without having them come to meetings on their video conferencing. But I just think it's a, it's, it's not, maybe in the future it's depends in the state pick it up and they fine tune it and it's something that's normal, but it's really not that hard. We're a small city council and if you want to have a say and vote, you, you turn up to the meetings. I think it's it's a time perhaps for the a future, but not now. But imagine, Councillor, you can have a glass of wine on the side of the camera where no one can see it. Just get behind me, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, wine, members? Councillor, yeah. Councillor. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I echo that. If there was merit in this idea, then uh, then the federal or state governments would have introduced it long ago. And, and frankly, I could see it being abused. There would clearly be circumstances in which people might prefer to stay home and cook yeah. dinner and watch a bit of TV while keeping an eye on what's happening with Press the science debate. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Have a glass of wine, <laughs> maybe two. Oh my God. Actually, I am I am warming to this idea, Chair. I, I am warming to this. And the more I think about it, these long committee meetings, you can actually take in a movie. And if it went really over time, you can have supper as well. I, yeah, it, uh, and just think strategic planning days on Saturdays, you could mow the lawns with the phone there and just keep an eye on things. That'd be great. That's correct. So, uh, yes, I will support this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Now, is any other comments or debates? Summed up? No. Okay. Just, just one additional point I'd like to make in summing up, and that is there are councils sort of that cover very vast areas who, where people have to travel for no good point other than to be in the room where they can actually effectively be in the room through technology. I think this could be something if you lived in the you know, remote Australia, remote, remote South Australia, it could be really helpful. So I think still, I still think it yeah, has, has the yeah. merit. Thank you, Councillor. I put that. All those in favour? All those against? That is lot. Councillor Martin, I'm confused. Yeah. No, no, I'm not confused at all. Um, so you said you vote for it, then you're not. No, no, I said it's tongue in Okay, that's fine. So I'll put that again. All those in favour, members? All those against? So that is lost. And um, that would conclude our workshop. On what topic? The LGA motions. Okay, what would you like to know? My question is what's the process, please, on other motions that are put up at the um, AGM that we vote on, but we don't know what they are? Do we have a position on them? That's a good question. We have to trust you. Well, 
Well, I'm... So that's a question to administration, or to, that's not really a question to administration, by the way. Yeah, it is. No, it's a question. Pro, pro, so there are other motions put up by other councils. So your delegate so gets to... Ask, your delegate gets yes, to I know, but the delegate doesn't know Should the position of the council. Can I ask? Can I ask? That? No, it's, it's a Just, process question. Though. It's a process question first. So let's I get an ask from. Know. Let's get an ask from the CEO first. Three chair, three chair. Um, look, yeah, obviously, the council delegate is delegated the authority to act on behalf of council. However, um, it is quite feasible that we bring to you all of the list of motions and those that are taken. Like by exception, that you'd like to have a, a conversation and debate about to instruct your delegate. That's quite quite a feasible proposition. Well, I don't know what this council has done in the past, but that's feasible. I just think it's important because um, there are motion. I think that, that whatever the, we look at as a process to advise us of the prospective motions that we have them brought to this council, even just for noting in the in. Okay. In our papers. So no, that will be done. So I'll get a comment from Councillor Claire Hand in relation to this. Okay, given that I've probably represented, I'm probably the only one here who's represented council at either the LGA or the National General Assembly, what council administration generally does is goes through the motions to look at where we have a policy position and so then provides me with that information and I vote in line with council's policy position. For those things that we don't have, may not have a, a policy on, um, that has generally been left to listen to the debate and then make a decision. Um, but I'm very happy either way. If people in, on the floor here want to determine everything prior to me going there, um, so be it. As long as it's reasonably open and transparent, I don't have any objection. But to actually not be in a position where you can listen to the debate and make an informed decision based on the debate, I think is a little bit restrictive and but happy, happy for it to be, um, maybe we bring a report back from the administration on how we might approach it in a transparent and efficient way. And I just say that when I was at the National General Assembly in Canberra, the, um, I had someone from administration sitting next to me and I also had the LGA recommendations as well. So it was a matter of looking at our own policy statements, looking at the LGA um, position, and then listening to the debate. And if you think that's easy, uh, I think you're mistaken. It's actually quite a juggling exercise. But if you're not gonna listen to the debate and make decisions based on an informed, make an informed decision based on the debate where there's no policy, I think that's too restrictive. Councillor, thank you. Councillor Malaga, do you have another question? Well, no, my, my, what I would like... We're not commenting, um, that's all. So no, we're sure. in a workshop mode. What, what my point is that what I'd like is that that advice that goes to one councillor, go to all councillors, and I'd also like how we voted to come back to this council. OK, so that's no to take on board. Any other comments from administration? Through the chair, um, to reflect um, Councillor Clarehan's commentary as well, is that at the last um, one for the National um, Assembly, we actually provided a report to Council that outlined all of the motions that were on the list, yeah. a link to the document that had the discussion points from the relevant councils that did it. And within the time frame we had, which was extremely tight, we went through where we could and identified any policy positions that were in existence at the time. So I'd suggest, the, I'm looking at the dates at the moment, we probably have to take on notice as to whether we can replicate that again going forward. It will depend on when they release the list of the accepted motions to go through, the timeframes we have in front of us, but either way, there'll be information distributed to members in relation to what's on the agenda and the information provided to the delegate time. And, and could I just make one more point through the chair? Councillor Milani might like to actually attend one of the LGAs Councillor, to see how it works. That's not because just because no, I'm the representative, you Councillor, you therefore, just Councillor, because I'm the representative you've asked, doesn't you've mean asked. to say that I'm the only one that yes. can attend. Any councillor can attend the LGA. So I look forward to um, other people finding out how it all works. Councillors, questions were asked yeah, and they were answered. Any other discussion in relation to that item? Yes. Being item seven, be it that there's none. Megan, thank you very much for your time. Item eight, so we are dealing now with the infrastructure asset management plan. Uh, Councillor Martin pulled that item, but 
it's actually a workshop, so uh, we have a... Can I talk about Yes, so we will keep it brief. Oh, no, I'll be, I'm happy to move the abstract uh, member. Okay, if members are prepared to accept that. Councillor Martin, you moved the item, you requested that the item be uh, taken out. Are you happy to accept that recommendation? Can I, can I just ask a question? Just, just one second, please, ma'am. I've got a motion from Councillor Moran. I need to deal with that first. So, Councillor Moran, you have moved that this uh, be accepted. Okay. Councillor Martin, are you happy to second? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we have a mover and a second that have been accepted. Councillor Moran, would you like to speak to it? Um, I will reserve my right to Councillor Martin. Um, yes, look, I will speak to it. Um, I, again, I'm uh, really delighted. Uh, um, and it, these are enormous tomes, but I'm really delighted that there is a formula uh, now in place for dealing with asset management and renewal. And, and I'm particularly grateful for the first time to have illustrations of what constitutes a poor quality road, a reasonable quality and a high quality. To have those kinds of markers is really important. But having, uh, having said that, um, and, and having been part of a council, by the way, which has allocated uh, a great deal of money to asset renewal, particularly where roads are concerned, I, I think it is important to note that on page 97 of the, uh, the Transportation Asset Management Plan, there is a warning that we are underspending by about uh, $60 million over the next 10 years on infrastructure for roads, footpaths, curb water table, bridges and traffic signals. That is to say that we need to find another $6 million a year just to maintain the service level to which we aspire. Uh, and in the context of a budget deficit of $41 million and already $13 million uh, next year in terms of borrowings, that's, uh, that's fairly sobering. But uh, I would ask uh, just one thing in relation to the reports, and that is that um, uh, the one related to electricity distribution be amended, um, because at page 14, it commits Council to um, the PLEC assisted undergrounding program and makes no mention of the council strategic plan, which provides for non-PLEC undergrounding of power lines as well. Uh, and that uh, to me needs to be uh, included in there. Um, and there was just one other thing uh, which uh, worried me a little. There is mention in the plan of um, renewal of some public sculptures or statues, including Sturts and others. Is that just clear? We're just getting a human dust off. in this direction. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair. Thank you. Does that mean, Chair, that we're just going to give them a dust off or are we going to remove So them? I'll take that as a question to uh, administration CEO. Yep. 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 Uh, through Chair, I can take uh, all those questions um, in that order if you like. Um, in regards to the transportation uh, funding, um, the plan was written at a time in 2014 15 uh, when a comparison was made to the then long term financial plan figures. Um, in the executive summary, um, there's a statement that says that in comparison to current long term financial plan figures, uh, Council is fully funding the requirements for renewal of the assets. So that's redundant? That's, that actual section of the report was accurate at the time of writing. However, um, since those drafts have been prepared, uh, you, you have actually taken on board uh, the, our position in regards to our recommendation in regards to the renewal of uh, assets, and that's been adopted now as part of your 16 17 long term financial plan. Okay, I'm pleased about that. Thank you, Councillor. You're comfortable with that, Councillor Martin? Yeah, that, that one, yes. That yep. uh, the second, second item referring to plaque um, undergrounding is considered as part of our lighting and electrical plans. Um, we took a report to Council in around October last year to talk to a specific plaque undergrounding program. Um, and we are aware that the strategic plan does talk to undergrounding and plaque at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah, and so we will acknowledge that. Um, the time that the plan was written and some of the stuff was put together was just at the time that the strategic plan was landing. Um, and I think it would be prudent for us to do a review of uh, that part of the plan to incorporate um, the strategic planning team. So, and the final question? And uh, Sturt and all those. Yeah. Uh, the final question in, in regards to monuments, um, 
from an urban elements perspective, we have a maintenance program to clean and um, take care of our, our monuments. However, the specific monuments that have been called out as part of this plan is a refurbishment, um, where they'll usually be taken down and a contractor will actually uh, refurbish those sculptures and bring them back to Nick. Thank you very much, Councillor. You're satisfied with those answers? Yes, so long as uh, has just been... Thank you, Councillor. So we've uh, had Councillor Moran reserve a right. Councillor Martin has spoken and asked the questions. I've got Deputy Lord Mayor Hender with her hand up and also Councillor Wilkinson. Just a question. If uh, this motion gets up to tonight, does it still come to Council next week? Yes. Yeah, OK. And I, I, I won't ask my questions now then. I'll yep. ask them between now and next week. I've just got some minor questions about Thank some of the details. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Wilkinson, before I take you, uh, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Clarehan had a hand up first. I apologise, I didn't see it. So, and then yourself. So, Councillor Clarehan, yes. and then Councillor Wilkinson. Just um, looking at some of the, um, well, one issue under the heading of transport through the chair, um, it said that we had an external auditor doing our footpaths who gave us a low to medium confidence rating in relation to the condition of our footpaths. Can we just, and then we did our own internal audit and suddenly the low to medium went up to medium confidence. What were they talking about there in terms of confidence? Yeah, through the chair, uh, I guess every asset plan has a level of confidence based on the amount of information that we have available to us. Um, previously, that footpath condition audit was done by a contractor and the methodology they used was quite simple. Um, and the results from that didn't really enable us to plan um, well into the future with regards to the renewal of our footpath assets. Um, since then, we've done the audit internally using our own staff and our own knowledge and expertise. Um, with a much, uh, more much, much more refined methodology. Uh, it's given us much better results, uh, so much so that we're able to produce uh, detailed works programs uh, many years out, including maintenance programs as well. So we're in a much better position. Another question, in relation to the, um, the three-year renewal program, and you've got here Jeff Cott Street and Gilbert Street curb and water table, um, What's the story with the Gilbert Street curb and water table? You have to take this on notice and get back to Councillor Graham okay. for the next meeting? Yeah, yeah through Chair, it'll, it'll be basically on a condition basis uh, with the Gil sections of the Gilbert Street curb and water table will be replaced, but I can, I can confirm that with you if you like after this meeting. Okay, I just I just have some concerns about Jeff Cott Street when it's going to get onto the plan, because if it's a three-year plan, well, that's the new council, and who knows where they put it priority-wise. But anyway, you don't need to answer that. I had another question about um, the toilets. We had 5.8 out of 10 confidence level for our or feedback for public toilets. Does that relate to not being enough? Or does it mean that the condition of our public toilets is not very good? Uh, through the Chair, I think it relates to both elements. Uh, to be honest, I think the uh, accessibility to toilets in the city um, is reasonably poor in some locations. Um, there's a public convenience strategy, believe it or not, um, in regards to the, the rollout of the public conveniences in various locations. So we know where those locations where there's high demand um, and we've got a program in place to try and uh, put, put conveniences in those locations. Um, conveniences are also one of those things that get uh, um, get reused, um, can get penalised from time to time uh, and we're going to make sure that we maintain and, and, and keep conveniences uh, clean for public to use. So. Thank you. And one more question related to the... Um, <laughs> it's been three more questions and one more question. Oh, there you go. And the, ple the plec... Um, situation. You, have we any idea of which of those projects that PLEC are interested in joining with Council for undergrounding of power lines? Uh, yes, we do uh, through the Chair. Uh, Bartels Road is uh, underway this year, so we've actually received PLEC funding for Bartels Road. Um, so they're two thirds funding that project this year. Um, other roads on the proposed PLEC program are Jeff Cost Street. Uh, Gooja Street, <coughs> and there's a few others which I can't quite okay. remember. No, that's good. Thank yeah. you. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, I'd just like to get confirmation from the administration that in supporting this 
uh, report tonight that um, we're not going to be, because we've got a workshop pertaining to urban elements and reviewing, you know, like not having the Cree glary light fittings, removing that from our public realm thing, replacing the white concrete with slate grey, um, uh, getting rid of the black plastic uh, posts around, the, look like death markers around the parkland with hardwood timber, you know, it's, it's example three, example, that I'm not going to be then told, oh no, we've now endorsed this support, so yeah, you know, please, um, that in endorsing this tonight, you know, we're not going to be told, oh, we've endorsed it for four years and we won't be able to revisit those urban elements. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilkins, you're, you're referring to the upcoming workshop yeah. in um, mm. regard to Mount yeah. Move and Adelaide Design Manual. Design so yeah. the, um, the impacts of that workshop or outcomes of that workshop will not impact, this, this work will not be impacted by that or by the first yeah. Excellent, members. So look, we've flushed this out. Councillor Moran moved it. If there's no one else that wants to make any comments, I'm going to refer to the CEO for a brief uh, comment and then Councillor Moran to sum up. Through you, Chair. I just want to say in a short space of time, I think we've come a very long way with our assessment and plans and, and a significant amount of work has been done by the team, particularly Phil and Madeline, I know, and the team themselves. And, uh, I think it just needs to be recognised what's been achieved and the way they've been presented, the summary documents, I think are very clear. And when we go out to the community, I think they'll be able to understand exactly what these plans are about. So I think that needs to be recognised. Excellent. So Councillor Moran, summed up. I put this to you, members. All those in favour? All those against? That item's carried. Members, we move on to item um, 13. Uh, any other business? I think we don't have a quorum, we lost our quorum. No, we've got the Lord Mayor. That's fine. Um, so we'll move on to item uh, 14, just to a motion to exclude, to deal with a confidential item relating to business operation report 1516, June year to date, moved by the Lord Mayor. Can I have a seconder, please? Seconded by Councillor Martin. Any debate? I put this. All those in favour have gone to confidence. All against? That is carried. Uh, any members that are not directly associated with this item of the public or staff, if they could please exit the room so we can deal with item 15. Members, item 15. Is With that, I declare the meeting closed at 8.23 p.m. Thank you, members. Sorry. Uh, what's, your, what's your plan? What's the plan, please? Um, Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.